So I want to welcome you all for joining us today. Um, and we hope that this event, which is part two to our first women's conference, becomes a regular uh, growing event for, for Muslim women scholars to come together and address important issues for us, our community, um, and our growth and development. Um, in our first program, Womanhood Defined, our scholars shared with us best case scenario, sharing the lives, experiences, and qualities of womanhood perfected. We said womanhood defined, but really it was womanhood perfected um, through the lives of the, the per four perfect women, Sayyidah uh, Asya, Sayyidah Maryam, Sayyidah Khadija, and Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anhum, and the qualities that they uh, embodied really in, as Allah outlines, in reaching perfection. And so it wasn't their social class, their marital status, wasn't their jobs, it wasn't their businesses, it was really their devotion, their dedication, and their commitment to sincere focus on Allah that gave them the status of perfection. So today, we gather again. And this time, it, for those of you who don't know, it's actually Women's History Month, um, to, to, to question what we hear about womanhood around us. So there's a lot coming around uh, the topic of womanhood, what does it mean to be a woman, uh, not just in our own communities, but uh, you know, in academia, society at large, on the news, in TV, different programming. And we say, so today we're here to ask questions and really focus on understanding the, the dominant narratives, understanding the messaging um, that women receive throughout history and that continue today. And we want to, re uh, each of our scholars will address a specific topic. They'll um, give you some historical uh, context, um, talk about the falsehoods and, and the role of women, and look at, um, inshallah, presenting a more balanced religious uh, perspective for us. And so, uh, again, we welcome you all. Um, and we hope that from here, we can build a framework to reimagine ourselves. So reimagine ourselves as women, reimagine our, who, our, who our daughters can be, who our mothers are, who our sisters are, and build upon that to really create a better, more functional, spiritual community, inshallah, that we can you know, grow in, inshallah. So that's what um, we hope to do. You know, that's a big task. So we ask for your du'as. Start us off. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I was asked to speak about the topic, better hidden, question mark. This topic, the little blurb says, should women just be homemakers and stay out of the affairs of men and the domain of men, such as public life, formal education, specialized training, employment, financial independence, civic engagement, and so on. You probably have an understanding why they put me to talk to about this topic. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get right to it then. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Where we'll start the conversation is where the assumption comes from. The very first thing I'm going to tell you, my dear sisters, is that always question assumptions. Where does the assumption that so many of, we hear this, we hear this not just, by the way, it's not just from men. I hear this very often from women too, that a woman should stay at home. It's an assumption. Where does the assumption come from? That's the question. You see, when you say a woman's place is her home, it can mean a lot of different things. And this is what we're going to break down together. I have heard in scholarly circles, both men, and women, try to use the verse in the Qur'an that talks about, does anyone know the verse? Thank you. وَقَرْنَ فِي بِيُوتِكُنْ Now, those of you who've been attending the Friday Night Halakas, we're going over the text called مَحَارِمُ Lisan, the prohibitions of the tongue. And just a few weeks ago, we talked about the prohibition of taking out of context, verses of the Qur'an or hadith. Yes, 
You see, the Qur'an was revealed in which it has multiple and heavy meanings. And even if you are a native Arabic speaker, you can't just open the Qur'an or even the body of hadith and say, oh, I think it means this. Even if that's what seems it like on the surface or seems like a literal explanation of the verse. You see, this ayah is ayah 33 in chapter 33, Al-Ahzab. And it starts out, وَقَرْنَ فِي بِيُوتِكُنْ But it is right in the middle of a series of verses that come before it. See, context is everything. You have to understand سَبَبْ nuzul. Why did this ayah, why was this ayah re uh, revealed? What was the sabab of its revelation, the reason for its revelation? There's a series of verses. And it starts out addressing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wives. It's a series of verses that talk about at the way, you know, the, the point of it is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala saying to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you wives are the mothers of the believers, you have a special place in Islam. You thereby you have special rules that belong only to you. Furthermore, you have a choice. If you wish the dunya and the embellishments of the dunya, the Prophet can free you and you don't have to be his wife. But if you choose to be a wife of the Prophet وسلم, you have special rules that apply to you. If you want Allah and his messenger, these are the rules. And this وَقَرْنَ فِي بِيُوتِكُنْ is embedded right in the middle of these verses because if you look even at verse 32, the verse right before it, and the verses prior to that too, they start out with, يَا نِسَاءَ nabi." O wives of the Prophet. It's talking to specific people. And thereby, the rules are for a specific set of people, the wives of the Prophet And it says, لَسْتُنَّكَ أَحَدٍ مِنَ nisa." You are not like any other woman. Now, sisters, when people take something from the Qur'an and try to extrapolate it and apply it to everybody, you can see where the problem is. Let me tell you, in case anyone's still feeling a little like, well, hold on, isn't it supposed to be <laughs> that we understand these are the wives of the Prophet? What about and the mothers of the believers who have very special rules even after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu There's certain things they can't do. They can't marry anyone else. They are, they are there almost like an intensive um, training with the Prophet Sallallahu to be the educators and teachers because they are the ones who are living directly with him. And they become the teachers <laughs> of our ummah, right? So, somebody might say, but wait a second. We thought that this was something that people often say. A woman's place is her home, a woman's place. Where is it coming from? Now, we have different ethnicities here. So let me try something out. I've heard with my own ears, people who are, and I don't want to, and please don't be offended by this, but these are true statements that I've heard. I've heard some Moroccan people say, and very similar statement, by the way, by many of our um, Pakistani community who will say something to the effect of the woman only should leave her home twice. Have you heard this? She leaves her home, probably other ethnicities too, I'm sure. She leaves her home, her father's home, to her husband's home. And from her husband's home to the? A'udhu <laughs> Billah. So you know this statement. Yeah, and you know it so well that you <laughs> immediately quoted it. Or I can't, I can't do the Persian, subhanAllah, but our Afghan uh, sisters will say, and you have to help me with the, the wording here, that a woman should either be home, kur, yeah, or, or what? Or in the grave. Kur. So you know the statement. Nonsense. Okay. When I was younger, I think I would have been a lot more careful and PC and careful with my wording. And I think after all the years of therapy that I've done and counseling of families and people, 
This is cultural nonsense. And it has caused so much pain and so much difficulty for so many people unnecessarily. And I'm not blaming just the men, because we women do this to ourselves too. And we do it to each other as women. And it is incredibly important to understand context because context is everything. And I want to keep this conversation very balanced. Ansa Sosan, who was actually here last conference, if you remember her, mashallah, one of my very dear teachers, had this beautiful model. And I want to start with this and I'll probably wrap up with it again at the end. She calls it the circles of concern. Your circles of priorities your circles of influence. Think of it as a circle, within a circle, within a circle, within a circle, concentric circles. And at the core, if you really want to know your priorities, the core is what? Is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nothing tops that, nobody. Now here's where people get confused. You see, there's a pre-marriage, set of circles and there's a post-marriage set of circles. Because pre-marriage, the circle right after your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your relationship with your parents and your siblings, then comes your extended family, then comes your community, then comes your, the ummah, then comes all of humanity. Post-marriage, there is another circle for those who are, Allah has written for them to get married, which is not everyone. There's another circle that comes in and it kind of elbows out the circles a little bit. And people get really confused at this one because right after the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right at the core, once married, the next circle out is actually the spouse and the children. People go, oh, what about my parents? Well, listen, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it this way. In his eyes, Jalla Jalaluhu, and how he judges us, he puts and says, who is the only person who can be responsible for this circle. Earlier this week, I was doing a training for imams. And I said this exact same thing to them. <laughs> I say this model, by the way, to everybody. Imams, non-Muslims, <laughs> here are your priorities, right? Right? Because it's a human thing, not just a woman's thing, not just a Muslim thing. And I said to the imams, that next circle out after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your wife and no one else can be her wife but you. Now, the opposite could be ostensibly different, not our conversation for today per se, and my guess is not many of you would wanna be in that case. But your spouse is your spouse, and no one else can be your spouse, the spouse, that person's spouse but you, which is why they're in the next circle. Your kids, if you're blessed with them, biological children, you can only be the biological parent mother or father of that child, and no one else can be. Other people can parent and help, but no one else can be the biological parent, which is why that's there. And for siblings, if you have them, the, parents, the responsibility on parents can be shared. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. This is true, men and women. <laughs> men and women. Which is why when we look at the ayah we're looking at, وَقَرْنَ فِي بِيُوتِكُنْ The concept of, well, isn't it better to be at home? Islam says it is encouraged for both men and women. There is no difference. The priority of your spouse and your children and your home is equal to men and women. No one else can be the husband other than him. No one else can be the father other than him. No one else can be the wife other than you. And no one else can be the mother other than you. Do you see what I'm saying? Which is why the companions of the Prophet وسلم, understood this so well. So you look at someone like Abu Darda, one of the famous companions of the Prophet, and he has this beautiful saying that he says, The best monastery for a man is his home. It's for men and for women, because the priority, as we showed in the circles, is for men and women. So this concept of be in your home and you should, women should always be in their home, let's look at the mufassirun. Let's look at the scholars of hadith. Now this is beautiful. Earlier we heard Ansani had recite, mashallah. And she recited in the Hafs recitation. As you know, there are 10 different recitations of Qur'an, 
And there is a beauty in the fact that there is some differences and nuance, most of them overlap by the way, but there are some words and some differences between them. This verse is one of them. In the Hafs recitation, we read, which translates into, again, talking to the wives of the Prophet and settle or stay in your homes. But that's not how it's always recited because in the scholars of the, rest of the narrators of Kufa and Basra, they recited as وَقِرْنَا فِي بِيُوتِكُنْ with a kasra, with kirna, <laughs> which changes the meaning. Not totally, but there is a different meaning. And there it means, and remain dignified. And remain dignified and serene in your homes. Huh? So there are scholars, even in the recitations of the Quran and the tafasir, that said, even for the Prophet's wives, there is a difference of meaning, let alone the rest of us. And so then the scholars of tafsir come and say, and you have the very famous um, Tabari, Imam Tabari, who says that because of this difference of meaning, and even in the original, you know, I mean to say, in the Hafs recitation of the word, whether it's qarna or qirna, they have both said that this means that it is an encouragement but not an obligation. Likewise, Ibn Battal said that this is not an obligation, but an encouragement. You have another, Ibn Hajar. These are all mufassirun, all scholars of tafsir, exegesis of the Qur'an. And he says the same thing, it's not compulsory. So where do you get people on the minbar and the khutbahs, because I've heard it in a khutbah, and stay in your homes, right? Stay hidden, it is better. It's better for a man and woman. What is this thing, this, this fascination about it's better for women? Because if everybody knew their priorities, everybody would be spending more time at home, <laughs> right? And then we don't have these very odd questions about like, should a woman get married or educated? What? Why is this an either or question? Why is it an either or question? Because that's not the tradition of Islam. That's cultural. Nonsense, mashallah. That's not the tradition of our noble predecessors, not of the women, not the prophets' wives, our mothers of the believers, and certainly not of the Sahabiyat. You want stories of the Sahabiyat here? Let's do this. Let's talk about some of the Sahabiyat quickly, mashallah, because you see what happens when we rely on knowledge of our deen. See what happens if a woman stays at home. <laughs> I love this. One of the scholars said, if, a, if the woman really does is forced to be home, then she's not able to engage in society, learn and, and, and trade and finance and, and figure out knowledge and go and seek and come and travel. All the benefits of that are taken away. So you know what happens instead? Literally taken in the book, it says, she becomes petty. If you are not living a purposeful life, something with purpose and meaning to it, then life is just a chore, the chores of life, and it becomes petty. The conversations become petty. The conversations about what you wore and who got what purse and what shoes and what car and what, <laughs> whose kid went to what school, and it starts to become very petty, or even worse. Yeah, I think that person on that show should have married that person and that person. Could you imagine this and ha happened and that happened and this happened and, and, and no, that bachelor should have married this. But who the been that? What a garbage. <laughs> I walked in the conversa into a conversation like this the other day and I was like, Ugh. <laughs> petty, petty, not purposeful. And yes, I'm, I'm maybe you call, call me harsh, fine. But it's petty, it's pettiness. What are you spending your time actually doing? I didn't ask you to be a scholar of Islam. But with the focus, men and women, of leading a purposeful life, there's no time for this nonsense. MashaAllah. Right? Look at the, look, if you want, let's, let's, now that we kind of question, now that we kind of question that assumption of that ayah, about whether a woman should be home and hidden, okay? Now let's look at proof. Proof from the Sahabiyat. Let's look at directly at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Because sometimes when we talk about modern, Cases, they're like, uh, but what about, what about the Prophet's time? Okay, let's talk about the Prophet's time. Let's talk about one of my favorite, I don't have a lot of favorite stories, but I love the story of Khawla. 
Khawla bin Thalaba. Do you remember the story of Khawla? I love the story of Khawla. So, Khawla bin Thalaba is a very important companion, Sahabiya, of the Prophet But the story I'm going to tell you here takes place as she's an older woman, and it's at the time of the Khalifa of Sayyidina Umar. Okay? And she walks up to Sayyidina Umar, who's walking through the, with his, with his uh, companions, you know, the, the Khalifa, right, the, the Caliph of the Muslims, <laughs> and she stops him. He's on his way for another meeting, and she stops him. And so he sees her and he goes to her and talks to her. And she tells him, it's beautiful. She says, oh, Umar, can you imagine like an auntie, like an elderly auntie? And she tells, now this is the Khalifa, okay? Umar, out of all people, okay? And she says to him, I remember you when you were just Umar. <laughs> you were just little Umar, mashallah, in the marketplace of Aukaz. And I remember when you were just herding your sheep with a stick. <laughs> you know how aunties do this? They totally embarrass you, right? <laughs> okay, but here's you're some important person and they're totally embarrassing you. Inshallah. And so, and then she says to him something very heavy. She says, fear Allah in your role as Khalifa in taking care of people. And know that if you fear the threat of punishment in the, hell, in the hereafter, you'll realize that the hereafter is not that far away. And if you fear death, then know you're going to miss opportunities in this life. And he focus on the present and be careful with that responsibility of the people that you're in charge of. So she's giving him this advice, but this is the Khalifa Umar. So his companion says to him, you left and you got late for the meeting with a man to talk to this old woman? That's, the, that's, that's what he said, that's literally what he said. So Umar says to him, whoa, he literally goes, whoa to you. Do you know who this is? This is, this is Khawla bint Thalaba. This is the woman who, if she were to speak to me all day long, I would stand there. Unless it was a prayer time, I'd go and I'd come back and keep listening to her. Because who am I not to listen to her when Allah listened to her from the seventh heavens? And because of her complaint to Allah, Allah revealed verses in the Quran. What am I referring to? Surah al Mujad. Allah has heard the one who complains to you about her husband in the Quran. This went earlier in life. She had went to the Prophet ﷺ because her husband had tried to divorce her and mistreat her. And she complained to the Prophet ﷺ. And long, long story short, is that at the time, the Prophet can't speak of his own desire, he has to use, right, revelation. He said, I don't have an answer yet, and Allah sent the revelation to answer her question. So here's Umar saying, who am I not to listen to her when Allah has listened to her from the seven heavens and revealed verses? They had no problem walking up to the caliphs. They had no problem going to the Prophet وسلم, asking questions. Look, another example quickly, Umm Darda who um, overheard one time the Khalifa, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, all right? And in the nighttime, he was looking for his servant, his helper. And so he calls out to him and the servant didn't answer. Maybe he was sleeping. So he curses him and she hears this. In the morning, she says to him, O oh, Caliph, I heard you curse your servant. So they check them. They, didn't just, they don't just question and ask and go up to, they even check them. <laughs> Right? If women weren't out and about and part of the system and part of the society and part of the education and part of the learning, how do you get stories like this? So here is uh, Umm Darda saying to the Khalifa Abdul Malik, saying to him, have you not heard of the Prophet Wasallam's hadith where he says, those who curse others shall not be accepted as intercessors or witnesses on the day of judgment. This is wrong. Now, for my activist sisters out there, this is what you call truth to power. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is really important that we start to understand who our noble predecessors were. So when people start to say, no, 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 sister. No, 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 young person. <laughs> Get married, stay at home. 
the issue isn't about marriage or about staying home because we all need to stay at home. The issue is about integrating and understanding and educating yourself about the deen. That if you have questions, the woman Sahabia would hear something and if they weren't sure of it, they'd go up to the Prophet ﷺ themselves. They asked the Prophet ﷺ for their own day of learning just with him. But they would also be, they would also be at the general learning circles with the men and the woman and, and at the prayers. Because we have several narrations where it says, and I was praying in the first line of the woman right after the men. Like, you know that they were there. Look, I'm going to share with you one more person because I just love her, mashallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I have too many people in the, in the, in the, in the, the hasira and the stories, but her that I love. Her name is Shifa. Shifa al Adawiya. Now, a little later, we're going to talk as I close up, we're going to talk about financial literacy and financial independence because this comes up as a question too. You tell me how you how in counseling, literally in counseling today, there are women who I'll ask them that there's tensions in the, in the marriage and the issues and financial issues, and I'll say, do you have access to your own account? It's a joint account. Do you have access to the account? No. You don't know how much is in your joint account? No. You don't have a way of it? No. Everything is blocked off, and I'm like, there is a real problem, an issue, when women don't have financial literacy. This is something Allah has given you and as Muslims on a silver platter from the first day of Islam. Why do we let our cultures take it away from us? Oh, that's what they do back home. No, 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 garbage, nonsense. It's not Islam. How do you have Shifa al adawiyah Speaking of Sayyidina Umar, in the Khalifa of Sayyidina Umar, he appoints the first minister of finance of Islam, the very first minister of finance of Islam, is a woman, and her name is Shifa al Adawiya. Shifa is actually a nickname. Her name is Layla originally, Layla al Adawiya, and they named her. They called. They nicknamed her Shifa, and she was given the role of all of the finances of the market. Now, when I say the market, do you understand what this means? You have to be able to go into the market. You're dealing with men and with women, you're dealing with money and you're dealing with debts and bankruptcy, you're dealing, and then she had this role that if anybody didn't know the rules, no, get this, the rules of trade and finance in Islamic fiqh, fiqh al-mu'amalat, the fiqh of transactions, in the section of the financial, uh, this is, we, we would, as fiqh students, we would call this chapter the headache chapter. <laughs> because there's so many complicated rules that wallahi yani, mashallah. And so here, the most faqih, the most knowledgeable of this topic of finances was a woman. And he appoints her this role, and it is said she would go into the market, and if she saw anybody who didn't know, men or women, who didn't know the rules well, or was trying to scam somebody, or was trying to you know, cheat, or just didn't know the rules, she'd kick him out of the market. <laughs> And under her leadership, the finances, the treasury of the Muslims expanded greatly. Now, is someone going to question the wisdom of Umar? That he puts a woman in this role and puts a woman in the marketplace and knows who's best suited for the job? Yet we can't even get women on our masjid boards, let alone be the treasurer of the boards. Okay, mashallah. <laughs> now, somebody could say, okay, you started the ayah about qarna fi biyutikun and the wives of the Prophet Does that just mean that they're home? I want to clarify this point in case anyone was confused by it. I, we don't, if we had time, we'd go into all the different wise of the Prophet, but let's just say one. Let's use one, maybe one that we don't speak of uh, frequently, Um Salama. Okay? You have Um Salama, for example, who we know, not only was she present in a lot of everyday matters, but the wives were also present in the battles. They didn't just stay home. They were always part and parcel of the Muslim society. And so Um Salama, one time there's a story about her where she's, she's doing her hair, and they hear the call out for the, the Prophet calling out for people to come and listen. And so she says, so she says to her helper, she says, I'm gonna go. And the helper says, No, no, he's calling the men. He says, No. She said, No. The call said, All people. I'm a person. 
<laughs> I'm going out to see what the Prophet said. And so she goes out and she listens and the Prophet وسلم, that day was talking about the Hawd, the pool, right? And, and, uh, and later, what's interesting about the Prophet's wives السلام, is that uh, uh, is that they would is that they would learn the same lesson that the Prophet said publicly later in their homes. Like he would give them their personal lesson. Remember, he was training them to become our teachers. So she was going to hear this again later, but she wanted to be out there in the fabric of society. There are other narrations that talk about in the battles. You could see the wives of the Prophet ﷺ skirt back and forth, running back and forth, trying to give people water and help people and remedy people. And even, even she felt the reason she got her nickname, she felt the one about the finances, not, not a wife, but one of the companions, Sahabiyat, is because she was actually also on the battlefield helping medicate. So she got the nickname because she was very specialized in being able to treat sores, right? Polymaths, mashallah. <laughs> And so, and then, and, and think about Um Salama too. In another instance, when the Prophet وسلم, was trying to enter Mecca the first time and was stopped, and he wanted to tell all his companions, "We need to turn back," and nobody wanted to listen. Who did he ask advice from? Um Salama, his wife. He said, "I don't know what to do," and she said, "Why don't you shave your hair first, indicating it's done, and then they will follow you and shave their hair, and everyone can leave." Now, how would he have asked her advice if she wasn't there? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? It is really important to understand the context and to question the assumptions about what does it mean a woman should be home. Now, we talked about priorities. Where I'm going to end, my sisters, inshallah, is really thinking about things like education. I, I said before, why is it an either or between education and between our religion? between marriage, between having children. There's a balance. Here's the balance. There should be not some false Islamic pretext that people say, oh, but Islam says it would be better for you to be a mother. I saw my teachers balance beautifully whatever Allah gave them. Some women, Allah gave them marriage, some didn't. And from those who are married, some Allah gave them children, some didn't. But whatever Allah gives you, there's a perfect balance to the best of your ability. But you know what that means? You know what happens in our societies? We have extremes. We push people, push, push, push to education. And so you have women who are told, prioritize your education, prioritize your job, prioritize climbing up that corporate ladder to the neglect of potentially getting married and forming a family, if it's even written for her. Then you have the other extreme of, no, 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 forget higher education, you'll never get married and have children. Extremes. Both are extremes. And then we have members of our society that want it all. <laughs> we have family members and aunties of ours who want everything. They want you to be the superwoman. But then when you really need them, where are they? I mean, I don't usually disclose a lot, but I'll share this one piece of my own life. My family told me, we can see that you can do higher education, but you're gonna get married too. <laughs> and so while you're doing this, you're going, we're gonna figure this out in parallel. And when you do that, you need to show up. And they showed up, that's a barakallah. People come up to me all the time and say, how did you do this? And I say, I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of people <laughs> whose hands were in the pot al allowing for this to happen. My eldest who's here with us, may Allah bless her, inshallah, will tell you that there were a lot of hands in raising <laughs> the children, subhanAllah, that there were a lot of hands helping out. Because if you're going to push forward somebody to join and be leadership and be in leadership and be in education, then in traditional societies, it said that there were at least four hands for every child that was born four different pairs of hands that could help out. In our nuclear family type societies that we have here, especially in the West, there's some research that says it is the nuclear family that is actually one of the reasons for the amount of child abuse and neglect that we have. There is something to be said about multiple hands helping out. And if you're going to push your kid towards education, you better be there when they need your help for kids too, right? Just saying, mashallah. And if they are not educated, then we deal with people believing 
weird cultural misconceptions like what we have here. I talked already about financial independence and how it's important that we have this, and I'll just ask you this. Last conference, I spoke about Khadija, radiallahu anha. How do you have Khadija having an entire business, incredibly wealthy, unless she had financial literacy? How do you have a shifa that we were talking about today being the Minister of Finances, unless this was something already part of what the woman did of Islamic societies. Lastly, civic engagement, and this is where I'll end, inshallah, serving your communities. If the circles of priorities, I said I'll end with this, inshallah, and so if you were back with it, if the circles of community mean that your core, which is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is solid, and your family is in a good place, then of course, by all means, Part of charity isn't just money that we give. Charity in Islam is also our time, it is our knowledge, it is our effort. That is charity. When you tutor somebody with the knowledge you have, that's a form of charity. It doesn't have to be dollars in a box. When you volunteer of the time, you say, I don't know a lot, but I have time to help. Right? There's a pantry back here, mashallah, in this masjid, and other things happen. You know, you give your time, you give your time. That's a form of charity, even if you didn't pay anything out of the pocket because you didn't have much. All of these are forms of charity and forms of civic engagement. When you take the woman out of that, or you go to the other extreme of what we call the social justice warriors, right, you end up with what? You end up with people, and I'm going to use this example because I have people in my life who love dolphins, <laughs> beautiful, majestic creatures but they're all about save the dolphins and their house is a wreck. Save the dolphins and for the younger people, your room is a mess. This is a lack of understanding our priorities. It can't be one extreme or the other, mashallah. And lastly, our yardstick, my worry about civic engagement and people going into you know, social justice, type work is people jump on a bandwagon of anything and everything that's happening today, even if it doesn't apply to us. We have a yardstick that we measure things by, and that's called the Sunnah of the Prophet If that cause out there fits with Islam, by all means help. And if it doesn't, you have no business in that. Sheikh Sharawi said this beautiful statement, and some of you have been in my holocaust have heard this before because I love it. And he says that mankind has been in darkness and Allah gave humans the ability to try to figure out light. So somebody figured out a candle and that was the amount of light they were able to bring. The next person figured out electricity and so they created a light bulb. So more light and more sustainable light. The next person said, let's put multiple light bulbs on a chandelier, oh, more light. Now you have lights that are so powerful when you think of a stadium, athletic stadium at night, playing a game at night, right? It is so bright in that stadium, right? When you're in it, it feels like it's daytime. That's how bright it is. So different people have been able to get different amounts of light depending on the gift Allah gave them. But when the sun comes up in the morning, you literally have to squint to see whether that stadium, powerful stadium lights are even still on or not. The sun is like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his sunnah. It outshines everything and anything that's man-made and that humans came up with. And so we have a yardstick, it's called the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If your civic engagement falls within it, alhamdulillah. And if it doesn't, toss it out. And so I hope, inshallah, as we talk about this and really talked about the different facets of a woman being hidden or outside or inside, we understand some core things. We all need to do better in our homes. We all need to do better in our priorities. And inshallah, this is inspiring to really help us move forward. Barakallahu fikun. Forgive me for any mistakes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and preserve us and really make us from the type of woman who understand our priorities because it is with that that Allah gives us the barakah and the tawfiq, the success, to really be able to do well. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I'm going to welcome Ustadha Hussain Mujaddidi.
Uh, Stella Hussain Majedidi is the co-founder of Mental Health for Muslims, a site dedicated to providing mental health related content tailored for the Muslim community. She has served the American Muslim community for over 20 years as spiritual advisor, mental health advocate, writer, editor, mediator, interfaith organizer, public speaker, covering a variety of topics including women's issues. She currently offers uh, monthly self-development development and spiritual wellness classes at the MCC East Bay Masjid, which is this masjid, and off, uh, offers regular educational workshops for students and teachers at local Islamic schools, including my own classroom. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I wanted to thank Rahma Foundation and the Jannah Institute, MCC East Bay, all of the organizers uh, for bringing us back together here again, Alhamdulillah. After our last session, we had so uh, much positive feedback and it's really beautiful to see the community coming out again and of course those who are watching online. So Alhamdulillah, this conversation as Ustaz Fadwa mentioned is a little different than our last conversation in that we're really dealing with contemporary issues, contemporary struggles. So I have the topic about this notion that women's roles and function in society have to do with how desirable they are. And we're gonna break this down together, inshallah. Now we did mention before, Ustaz Fadwa, that the content of this topic is obviously for um, a, a more mature audience. So if you have younger girls, I would ask you to please take them out, if you would, just for my comfort level and your comfort level and their comfort level, and then inshallah we can proceed. But I'll give you a moment to do that if you feel the need to do that. With that said, again, here is the description that we put out when we uh, gave you the, uh, the, the program details about this, um, this message. It's a toxic message, but it's a message that is found in every element of our, of our society. Uh, from a very young age, girls are taught to think of themselves in this form of, uh, of the, or, or focusing on the physical and focusing on, on, on that part of who they are. And then of course, in our cultures and then in media, and we'll, we'll get to all of that. Um, but I really wanted to talk about this discussion. And what I'd like you to keep in mind is this beautiful quote that actually someone posted yesterday, a, my, um, a relative of mine on Instagram, and I thought it fit this perfectly. Because really, women have so much potential as we have already learned, alhamdulillah, with Dr. Rania's beautiful talk, and we will come to learn in, in the other talks as well, but we have so much potential. It's usually the environments that we are in that prevent us from reaching that potential. So I want you to keep this idea of, you know, of, of how can we individually, on an individual level, also as a, as a community, make these changes to the environment that we are subject to as women. And so with that said, we got to go back a little bit. So bear with me because this is going to be um, kind of like a women's studies class in a way. I'm going to take you on um, a, a little bit of a, a, a stroll through, through the past to get to where we are today to explain. Because again, as Dr. Rani beautifully said, context matters. So here's the history. It's so important that we as women know about this, these two major movements that happened almost simultaneously. And of course, I'm talking about the sexual revolution and the women's movement. And there's not enough time to go into all of the major things that unfolded during that very public, uh, or, or politically um, intense time. But these are some of the highlights that I feel like all of us as women have to understand. So first, we want to look at the uh, you know the pill, and it's we should know obviously what that reference is. But when it was uh, manufactured and produced and became commercially available, and then also um, the timeline in terms of the political activism that was going on. Of course, we were in the midst of a war, and so there were a lot of um, this culture that was right here, and for those of us in the San Francisco Bay Area, right here in San Francisco in the Haight-Ashbury district, 
there was this movement and it was like a commune of people who basically came together with these very, very uh, different ideas, let's just say, uh, about um, you know, opposing war by, by spreading love, but their ideas, of course, were perverse and they uh, you know, practiced a lot of things that, um, that were just simply uh, haram on every level. But this was, they caught national attention because there were a considerable amount of people flocking to San Francisco to be a part of this, right? Um, and I'm sure we all, we've all read or heard references to this in the past. But another really important person that we should know about is Betty Friden or Frieden, I don't know how to say her name, but Frieden maybe works. Um, she wrote The Feminine Mystique and she was also the founder of the organization NOW, right? National Organization for Women. Now, look at her statement of purpose. And I think this is so important because we want to remember that a lot of the people in that time, their intentions were good. They were good and well-intentioned people. They wanted to basically, you know, bring, as the statement says, right, women first and foremost are human beings, to assert the humanity of women. So that was the biggest part of, of what the, why they, they were speaking out and actually, um, you know, pushing back. And, and to give women the chance to develop their fullest human potential. So you can see that that is something, of course, all of us, if we can just put ourselves in that time, we would probably all want to be a part of a movement like that, that was saying, yes, we're human beings, we deserve rights, we, have, we deserve human rights. So in many ways that was the platform, but things changed, and so why did they change? Now this event is really important. This happened on November 18th, and this was in the Chinese room of the Mayflower Hotel. So the now basically had their second annual conference, and look at the amount of women that attended, 105 women. And it's less than what we have here, 105 women. And they came together to b go over the Bill of Rights, which was part of their charter, and, and they wanted to really you know, organize themselves. So in addition to the founder, Betty Friedan, there was another woman, her, Margaret Rowalt, and she's looking at her age, 72 years old, much older, uh, much more conservative, and she was appointed by JFK to uh, lead the Commission on the Status of Women. So she also had a very important role, and they were coming together, joint forces, to really, again, advance the cause for women. However, in, the, uh, in that meeting, uh, Frieden, she basically kind of pretty much uh, surprised and shocked everyone in attendance, especially Margaret Rowalt, because while they were there to vote on different matters, the very last vote that she saved was on abortion. And that was very divisive, uh, divisive. The, the crowd completely was divided. You had very conservative women in that room, like Rowalt, and then others who were more liberal. And Frieden, though, had a reputation. She was referred to as being someone so frightening that she was uh, all of the witches of Macbeth in one person. That's what some people said about her. So she was a very a force to be reckoned with. But she basically got the vote to swing in her way to push for a repeal of all laws that had to do with abortion. And this was something Rowalt was not happy about, so it, it, was, it caused a big problem. Now, two days later, what does she do? She decides to hold a press conference. Remember, 105 women, only I think, what was it, 57 women that voted? Um, 57 to 14. 57 women voted for abortion laws to be repealed, but she goes in front of a national, you know, she's, this is a press conference, and she speaks on behalf of 28 million American women and says that this is what we want. We want abortion laws to be repealed. This was a huge moment in this country because the conversation around this topic that before then was very taboo um, was suddenly changing and shifting. And of course, as media does, they're gonna pounce on sensational news. So the conversation starts to change, the rhetoric around you know, female sexuality, se sexual practices, uh, healthcare, all of these things, abortion start to really change, right? And then not too long after, you know, um, in 1973, of course, we have Roe versus Wade. Now, Betty Friedan was interviewed in 2001, and again, this quote is important. She says, ideologically, I was never for abortion. Motherhood is a value to me, and even today, abortion is not. I believed passionately in 1967, I believed passionately in 1967, as I do today, that women should have the right of chosen motherhood. For me, the matter of choice has never been primarily the choice of abortion, but that you can choose to be a mother. This, that is as important as any right written into the Constitution. So she was not pushing really for abortion, she was pu pushing for the, for the choice, right? But. I don't think she may have realized, Allah knows, the consequences of what she did because they were 
severe. And what I mean by that is, again, the introduction of a repeal on abortion law changed every, the, the attitude, the culture uh, around these topics. And we saw in, in 1963, a few years after the pill was introduced, right, 2.3 million women taking it. Single women started taking it because they could what? Have more sexual freedom. They could start doing things without the consequences of an unwanted uh, a pregnancy. And married women could limit their family size. So all of this matters because we have to ask questions, right, about how did we get to this place now? Well, all of these things are changing the way that our societies was, was previously structured. It starts to shift everything, right? And so then we have in 1964, this is a major Supreme Court ruling that this book, Henry Miller's book, uh, Tropic of Cancer was not considered obscene. When that you know, ruling was, was implemented, then what happens? It opens the floodgates for more and more books, magazines, movies, to begin to start to refer to and start showing more salacious, more sexual content. And of course, at the center of that is going to be women. The debates, of course, have continued ever since for decades on all of these topics, from birth control, abortion, homosexuality, marriage, and divorce, pornography, all of these things started to just become mainstream topics that were debated between, of course, the, uh, the conservative uh, right and the liberal left. And that's continued uh, up until today and continues to be something of debate. 35% of, of births today, uh, FYI, are from unmarried women. So we can see a huge, again, shift because of all of these things. And of course, the steps, um, I mean, we, we should note all of these, uh, these things. So now, Let's get to some facts that, again, we should all know, especially if, you have, uh, if you're a mother and you have daughters. Um, it's so important that we know this. But the exploitation of female sexuality, again, as all of these changes were happening so rapidly, the advertisers and people in the film and movie ind industry, the entertainment industry, of course, seize the opportunity, right? People are, are, it's not as taboo as it was. I'm not gonna get canceled, right? At that time, uh, they had a similar idea, concept of cancel culture. You couldn't speak on certain things without consequences, but suddenly those consequences were removed. So now it's about profitability. It's about making profits, right? So the, as, as they realize that there is immense profitability in exploiting and objectifying women, they began to do that. For decades after, the industry practice was to do what? And you can see this, I shared actually with uh, Usada Fadwa uh, um, a, a link yesterday that was so disturbing to look because it was someone who had basically collated all of the these ads over how many decades that showed the objectification of women, men, uh, everything. But it was just really disturbing to see the the, the, the massive amount of, of uh, you know, these types of imagery that we've been subjected to that we may not even realize. But dismembered ads are something that we should know because I, I remember I watched, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but it can make, a, when you start to see it or understand the, the definition of these things, that you'll start to notice it and it's gonna affect you. But what, what is a dismembered ad? When you take a woman and completely um, you know, parse her into pieces, she's no longer a human being that you feature to, you know, in whatever advertising you do, you just look at her as body parts. So an arm here, a leg here, uh, you know, mouth here, other obviously parts uh, as well. Um, but that was just industry practice. So we saw it in print media, billboard, commercials, selling everyday products, toothpaste, right? A woman has to be completely almost half naked to sell toothpaste. But this is why, because again, there was profitability in that. And so women became objects, playthings, prizes. This is what was standard. And then of course the subliminal messages, right, of these, uh, the non-existent ideal image of femininity, uh, which continues to pervade this, these unrealistic filtered and digi digitally manipulated images, of course, which have gotten even better as technology has advanced, but they're plastered everywhere. So we, as young girls, whether we know it or not, we're, we're seeing these things. You go to a, a store, a children's toy store, you can see images, and we'll get to, again, the targeted campaign uh, on little girls in a moment. But everywhere we look, we see these images in print, film, television, social media, and so as a result, and look at the statistic, this is so horrific. It is so horrific to think that in one year, a child, grade school children, could take in as many, 80, as, many as 80 thousand sexy girl portrayals. Watching what? Not adult television, kid targeted TV programming. 
they know what they're doing. They want to get inside our head. They want to break us down. They want to reduce us to nothing but a physical object that they can then use and manipulate however they want. And they do it at a very young age. And of course, the consequences are devastating. The APA um, in 2007 reported that uh, the sexualization of girls in the media is far more than the sexual uh, than, than boys. Right, the girls were of, often featured in revealing clothing, as well as with bodily postures and facial expressions. Again, young girls. We're not talking about you know girls of age. Young girls that imply sexual readiness. So they are being told to pose in in ways that invite that. And of course, you, you know, you can see that everywhere now in this culture, if you're looking at um, children's programming, but also, as I said, just going through the aisles of a store like Target, you'll see even the way that sometimes the girls, the posters for girls' clothing or other things, the way that they're positioned, it's very inappropriate. Um, and further studies that, again, show how uh, widespread this problem is. 58 different magazines, uh, according to this uh, study, had more than 50% of their advertisements were featured as sex objects women were. And then in men's magazines, 76% of the time they're, they're being objectified. Um, just again, you can look at the, 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 the numbers here, but it's just devastating. And then down here at the bottom, the American Journal of Psychiatry, um, this now has to do with social media, because we're again, we're bringing it, we're, we're kind of moving through the timeline here, right? We talked about the movements and then the print media and all of the, the changes that were happening rapidly. Now, with social media, we have uh, much more, more devastating problems in the fact that, in the sense that these devices are in our children's hands for nine hours or more a day, and they're being bombarded with this type of imagery. And uh, again, 10 to 25% of adolescents who were surveyed in this particular study had sent sex. If you don't know what that is, you should know that term, right? Because we have text messages and then there are sexed messages, which are sexually reference uh, text messages that are either, you know, with words or images depicting something of a sexual content. So almost a quarter of our youth are receiving and sending this type of um, uh, messages. It should really awake us. And here we see again the devastating effects it has on young teen girls, right? 80% of women, first of all, uh, say that the images of seeing other women on television and in movies, fashion magazines and advertising makes them feel insecure. So 80% of us, let's just be honest, we've all been impacted and if you think you haven't, I don't know, maybe you're, Allah's protected you completely, but at some point in our lives, we've probably done a comparison, we've probably watched something and felt really ugly, right? I feel like, oh, my gut is too big, my this is too big after watching you know, someone else. This is what, what, what is exactly intended to happen. They want to break us down, right? Because it's all about the, 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 the physical. 42% of girls, first uh, through third grade want to be thinner. First through third grade. How many of you here have first graders? Anybody have a first grader, a second grader, a third grader? Can you imagine that they're talking about dieting in that age? They're not out there playing. They're talking about wanting to be thinner. the billah. 81% of 10-year-old uh, girls are afraid of being fat, right? How did that happen? Right? How did it, we come to a point in society where that word is even, you know, is into this, again, a concern of children that young, that 81% of girls are afraid of that? SubhanAllah. And then, you know, these are comparisons about the average uh, girl is 5'4", but the model that's presented to us is the average height is 5'11". So the ideals presented to us, they're thinner, they're taller, they're obviously Photoshopped, they're, uh, they're, they're, they don't, that's not, true, you know, uh, image of, of uh, I mean, oftentimes um, of what they even look like, but yet we do this comparison. And then with young girls who are bombarded with this type of imagery, how is it affecting them? They're feeling lonely, depressed, anxious, lack of confidence, right? Um, and and so it's, it's clearly a problem that we need to be aware of. Now, this is the... Um, this is a really important, if you've never watched this, please, and if you have young girls, especially if you have teenage girls, 
please watch this with them. I watched this in college, and this was probably one of the, I remember it, it was very transforming to watch this uh, documentary. Jean Kilborn, for four decades, has been researching the exploitation of women in media. And she has an amazing uh, series that she's done every decade, SubhanAllah, where she just goes and she'll pull up ads to show. You, you think this is all, um, you know, we're just making it up? It's real and it's getting into our minds because when you're passively watching television or film, you're not always aware of what you're taking in. But if it, it's, there's enough of a stream of it and it's constant enough, it will start to break you down and make you feel bad about yourself. So, <laughs> excuse me, so um, definitely check this uh, documentary out and I think she even has it free, like it's on YouTube. So what is the mechanism that these advertisers use? Well, it's pretty simple, right? Attractive bodies are employed, so they find these models, they find these subjects, so that they can grab people's attention and then simulate what? Desire. So it's like, oh, and women, we, we have to, you know, that there's desire of a sexual nature that obviously men would feel, but for women, it's that desire to be like what we see on the screen. So it is desire, that is the impulse, that is what they're tapping into, right? And so, you know, and then they hope obviously that that desire will transfer to the product that they're selling. So, you know, as they say, buy the beer, get the girl. In this way, women's bodies are equated with commodities presented as rewards of consumption, right? And so here's some examples. And again, this was from that website that I mentioned. Um, just look here. This is a dismembered ad, right? We don't see a full body in, in the first two here. We just see legs. I mean, that's just terrible. And we shouldn't look at this like, oh, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal, especially when you look at the psychological effect and the ramifications of this type of messaging from a very young age on girls. And we wonder why we have an epidemic of, of, uh, and a crisis of eating disorders and other problems. It's because of these types of messages that get into our minds, right? And then look at this, this is a beer ad, right? Michelob, She's, she is the bottle. She's not even a human anymore. Let's just forget her humanity. Let's just infuse her into a beer bottle. That's how desperate they are to get female you know, uh, uh, consumers to buy their, and male consumers, obviously, they're targeting men. But still, you know, look at that. And then, I don't know about you guys, have you ever jumped on a car with like 30 of your homegirls and done a picture like that? <laughs> I, I don't know, Mufadwa, are we missing out on something? Uh, how unrealistic and ridiculous is that image. It's just so ridiculous, right? But we will just pass it by, you know, looking at an artist instead of being angered. Like, why? Why do we have to, you know, spread ourselves on a car? I mean, are we, is it, I don't know about you. I've, I've never met anybody who's loved their car that much to, <laughs> to do that. You know, and this poor woman at the bottom here with her dog, I mean, the dog got more <laughs> show time than she did. Her ankles were all that mattered here. Let's just hide her behind some wallpaper. I don't know what that is. Fabric. But let's feature her dog. Her dog is important. I mean, th this is the kind of stuff that should, again, anger us. Like, why, why are we okay with this? And going back to, you know, the now's charter, like, really what happened to the humanity of women, if this is what we're dealing with now? And this poor woman, I mean, she's got beautiful teeth, no doubt. But what about her eye? I want to see the rest of her. Why are you teasing me with just her face and, I mean, smile and nose? Why isn't, she, you know, this is, these are the types of things that are subliminal, but they get into our psyche, and we should just, again, um, be angered by these things, not look at them like, oh, what nice lipstick. No, that's, where's the rest of her, right? Exploiting the female consumer, right? $500 billion industry, the, the, the beauty industry. Individually, $313 per month women spend on beauty products, creams, lotions, makeup. And that's not to say that we can't beautify ourselves, which we'll get to. But just think about why. Do you see men, you know, I mean, I, I just saw yesterday, I noticed there's a Sephora and there's Ulta and there's just so many makeup stores. I'm like, you know, they're everywhere. They're really in almost every shopping center. Where are the men's, like, I don't see men having a store about beautification, like, just for them. But we, we need it, apparently, so we're so desperately, you know, unattractive that we need a store pretty much in every shopping center. It's just tragic. And in a lifetime, $225,000 you're spending on beauty products. The procedures, cosmetic. You know, I was thinking, I saw a video the other day of this dentist who, she was making uh, TikToks to try to save women from doing what? 
running uh, or getting on a flight to Turkey, which is now a popular destination, where they are doing what? Any dentists here? I think I would be so mortified as, as if I was a part of you know, that industry to see people, what they do. They shave their teeth down right to get the caps. You see it? These are young girls, sometimes in their 20s. So as soon as they you know, hit 19, 20, it's like your teeth aren't even good enough. My God, what's left? What is left? That we have to shave down the teeth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, which are such a blessing. I mean, you can talk to any medical practitioner, they'll tell you dental health, dental hygiene is related to overall health. And if you have good teeth, even if you don't think they're nice, say, Alhamdulillah wa shukr lillah, I have my own teeth. But these poor girls are being conditioned to think, nope, they got to get rid of them because if they don't look like chiclets in your mouth, you don't have nice teeth, right? Like you just got to have a set of chiclets. I mean, I don't know, again, how we got to this point where we had bought into this, right? Or, um, you know, other countries. Did you know the number, what is the number one country in the world for rhinoplasty? Iran. That's a Muslim country. So there are people, right, you know, I mean, in our own communities, maybe in our own families who are, again, so impacted by these messages that, um, that, that our own countries are now offering these services, subhanAllah. Now, the biggest target of the U.S. cosmetic industry is millennials right now. So if you're a millennial, age 18 to 34, they're coming after you. You're the target, right? Because some of us who are on the older side, we're over it. I'm over it. I'm over heels. I'm over lipstick. I'm over all of it, right? Thanks for masks. No more. <laughs> exactly. I'm over it. But those of you in the younger generation, they're coming after you. So they're, they're the, you're the ones that they're going to tell you need, you, everything's wrong with you. Nothing is good enough. Nothing. Right? Nothing. Astaghfirullah. So please watch out. And then what's really ironic, and this is actually tragic too, we have to feel sorry for these people because when you see Hollywood and you see these actors and these actresses and these singers who are just being used in every, and yes, they've made a devil's bargain likely uh, in, to, in order to be in that industry, we can say that, but they're still being exploited. 94% of women employed in that industry have been victims of some form of sexual harassment. That is shocking to me. That is shocking to me that they're still willing to be in an industry where they will report actual harassment on levels that are so troublesome. I mean, stuff a lot, you know, it's one thing to have an inappropriate joke, but look at, if you go down the list of this, um, propositioned for a sexual act or relationship, can you imagine staying in a job being propositioned inappropriately by someone? How many, I mean, most people who are, you know, thinking would be like, I, I don't need that job, right? Or to have, uh, you know, being, uh, if you go further down here, being forced to do a sexual act. 21% of the women were forced to do something. It's just tragic. So we shouldn't, you know, look down on them. We should feel sorry that they are so, again, uh, being so manipulated to think that they have to subject themselves to these things that they're willing to do that. But also we should be aware of how much it's affected women. Because if you look at this list here, right, um, this is the top artists that sing about sex and love. I, I looked at it and I was like, Safrullah, right away, look at it, Lady Gaga. I don't know SZA who that is. Lizzo, Whitney Houston, Beyonce. These are women. And then on the right side in the text, you'll find who got in 2021. She was prized, what a great prize, to have the most sexual references in her songs. Nicki Minaj, right? 43 direct inferences to sex in one song. On a, and then, um, of course, two years ago, or almost two years ago, I'm sure you guys remember, it was all over the news, you couldn't escape it, but there was a song that came out, it broke records. It broke records, many records, for the biggest 24-hour debut, and then also on YouTube, 55 million views in a week, and this was, of course, the terrible song, Audhu Billah, by Cardi B and Megan The Stallion. Um, I don't want to go into that, but just enough, this, this critique at the bottom is enough for you to know about this song. It's degrading and disempowering to women due to its sexually explicit lyrics and overt sexualization of women's bodies. So these are all realities, and our youth are, are, are you know, watching this content. I work with youth. I know they're listening to these. I've had literally classes with, and sessions with youth where they admit that these are the people that they're listening to in our homes. In our Muslim homes, these are the musicians that are 
you know, that our, our young girls are memorizing their lyrics and what are they talking about? And then, you know, this is the genres that we also need to be aware of. Um, and this, I thought, quote was really good. This was from, uh, you know, he was the, the, the president of this uh, Delamere Health that put this study together. But he said, music industry in many ways glamorizes and glorifies drug, drugs and alcohol use. Uh, drugs, and al drugs, alcohol, and sex within lyrics is something that can be influential on the behavior of children and teenagers. Just like adults, they begin to relate to the artists and situations in personal ways. That's really important. So it's not just that it's entertaining. They start to see themselves in relation to who they're listening to, to who they're watching to. So when you have a young, again, 12, 13, 14-year-old girl listening to this stuff, she's going to start comparing and contrasting and thinking, well, I'm not good enough because I don't look like, again, uh, Cardi B or Nicki Minaj or what have you. The evidence is there's ample evidence, there's, it's undeniable, right? To conclude that the sexualization of girls has negative effects in a variety of domains. We're gonna just quickly go through these. Cognitive and emotional consequences. It, you know, sexualization and objectification undermines a girl's confidence, and it also um, it causes problems emotionally, right, and self-image problems by increasing shame and anxiety. Mental and physical health consequences, we have eating disorders, low self-esteem, depression, depressed mood, and then um, as well as negative consequences to sexual development, right? That they can't develop a healthy sexual self-image. So really important content. I know it was a lot, but there's still a little bit more to go, so bear with me. But these terms we have to know and we have to teach our children and at appropriate levels so that they're aware of what they are and how to define them. What is sexualization, right? It's the act of endowing with sexual characteristics or of excessively emphasizing those characteristics in the real world. And then here the APA says that sexualization occurs when any of these four aspects occur. One, a person's value derives solely from sexual behavior or sex appeal, including any other characteristics. So when you have, again, women being told that they have to look a certain way, they have to dress a certain way, because that's all that they have to offer, that is sexualization. A person is held to narrowly defined standard that equates physical attractiveness with being sexy. So again, it's, all, it's so important to know these definitions. Um, and then a person's objectified um, because they're valued only for others' sexual use, right? And how many broken hearts do we have of young girls who are taught that unless they perform, unless they do certain things, they are of no value? This is the peer pressure of this modern age, right? Our age, some of us who are in the Gen X or older was maybe drugs, maybe, you know, doing something rebellious. Now it's, uh, you need to prove your, uh, whether or not you're, you're, you know, sexually available is where you get your worth from. And if you're not, doing those things, you're not considered worthy. So clearly all of these things are happening. And then sexual objectifi objectification is the reduction of a woman to her body, body parts, or sexual function. In other words, we have nothing else to offer. And this is, again, everywhere you see this. And it's a form of oppression, right? To be treated as a body or a collection of body parts, we're only valued, again, for our use of or consumption by others. So forget, you know, our our needs as long as we're you know pleasing other people that's all that matters and this is detrimental to a person's what self concept of humanity so when you have this message enough you start to forget your humanity you forget the other aspects of yourself and this is why we have a crisis that we have with so many young girls in this society um, and then the word desire, we're gonna go back to this point. What is being desired really means for women? Look at the key words in the definitions of desire as a, a verb, a noun, and then desirable as an adjective. I just pulled out some of the key words. Is this what we want for our young girls? That this is what we see ourselves? That, that we are a craving? I don't wanna be anybody's craving. No, thank you. Uh, that all we are is an object, right? Um, and and we're, our, own, our only purpose is to bring about lust and desire. But this is what that word desire and being desirable in this society means, right? So then how can we understand and define desire in a healthy way? So let's take back and reclaim what, what healthy desire is because this is a toxic message and none of us need to ascribe to it. Of course, we don't need to look any further than our dean. So simple, right? That's it, the presentation's over. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but all the answers, alhamdulillah, are in our deen. The Prophet sallallahu reminds us, verily, Allah does not look at your appearance or wealth, but rather he looks at your hearts and actions. This was for all men and women, 
stop hyper focusing on your external. It is about the inward, inward beautification. Verily, among what I fear most for you are seductive temptations in your stomachs and passions and the misguidance of whims. So he's telling us he feared that we would fall into these things where our whims and desires and lusts and the, the need to be desired by others will preoccupy us. And if he feared that for us, we should fear that for ourselves. Verily, every religion has a character and the character of Islam is modesty. Love this. Islam is modesty. This isn't the domain of only women. This is the domain of every believer. Very important message. Women in Islam, of course, we're honored, right? The natural aspects of us are honored without compromising the essential. It is possible to do that. What does that mean? Our bodies and souls, like that of men, are created primarily to worship their creator. And the form of the woman, women's physical form, in every aspect, psychological, intellectual, physiological, biological, emotional, sexual, is positively acknowledged and recognized in Islam. Positively. There are other faith traditions that make negative associations with those things. In our deen, they're all positively acknowledged and recognized. Women's rights, including sexual rights, are clearly stipulated and upheld in Islam. Our existence and value in society is indisputable in Islam. It's not even a question of debate. Our safety and security from all harm, all forms of external harm, must be guaranteed at every level of society. The objective of every man and woman in Islam is the same, to worship their creator and live righteously in obedience to Allah. Both men and women in Islam are taught to struggle against their lower self, the nafs, that part of us that pulls us into desire, right? To suppress ideas, impulses, and thoughts that lead to illicit desires and actions. Both of us are told to control that part of us, right? Both male and female sexuality and sexual desire is viewed as natural, healthy, and something to be enjoyed when explored within the boundaries of a lawful marriage between a husband and wife. And both men and women in Islam must guard their chastity and live according to the guidelines of Islam, which strictly emphasizes modesty in word, action, dress, and behavior for all. This is so beautiful. Did you know that there is a verse in the Quran that was revealed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not forgotten us. He never has, but this is so, so beautiful, right? That he's defending a single woman from the inappropriate gaze of men through this verse. Right? This is chapter 15, verse 24. We surely know who comes first among you, and we surely know who comes last. So according to Ibn Abbas, he said that a woman was so beautiful, she would come to the masjid, she would pray behind the Prophet She was very beautiful. Everybody acknowledged her beauty. Some men, because they had what? Taqwa. They had that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would come and they would go to the first row so they wouldn't be... Uh, you know, look at her. Others, however, would come so that they could be in the last row. <laughs> Why? So that they would, would, they would go into sajda, what would they do? They would peek through. Can you imagine? I'm sure we've all, we all those of us who have children, we've seen our, our children's sajda, right? Where it's not the, the forehead, it's the top of the head. Can you imagine grown men, a'udhu billah, on the top of their head, trying to get a peek at a sister because she's so beautiful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah to defend her. <coughs> so we should all think about this, that this, he's telling us, right? He's obviously teaching the men here, but also for us as women, that we shouldn't seek to be desired that way by anybody. We shouldn't seek, I mean, other than our spouses, obviously, but we shouldn't seek that to be looked at, right? in that way, which is what the society tells us to do. Be beautiful, go out there, put yourself out there. If you got it, flaunt it. We need to reject that. No, if you have it, protect it. Not if you got it, flaunt it, please. Exactly, exactly, mashallah. Now, because, and I have to credit Asad Fadwa, she told me, you gotta put something in about this because you know you're gonna get some pushback. Of course, beautification in Islam is important. It's not to say we completely leave that and let ourselves go. 
No, it's highly encouraged in Islam as a practice of what? First and foremost, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one's blessings. Because the body is a blessing. It is a blessing to have health and well-being. And so you take care of it, right? Maintaining cleanliness and hygiene and then following the prophetic example. So here, all these hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. He loves the loftiest of affairs and disapproves of pettiness, as Dr. Rani beautifully reminded us. Let go of the pettiness. Allah does not love the pettiness, right? The Prophet ﷺ said that no one with an ounce of arrogance in his heart will enter paradise. Now, in seeking to understand, remember, mashallah, the, the Sahaba were always you know, they wanted clarity. They asked about what, what arrogance means and they said, oh Prophet of Allah, what if a person likes to dress well? Okay, so for those who are into fashion, don't misread what I'm talking about. He answered that question. Again, Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. Arrogance is rejecting truth and looking down on people. So when you put on your nice outfit and your nice clothes, don't get ahead of yourself and start to think of yourself as better than anyone. If Allah's given you jamal, you have beauty, you have clear skin, don't look down on people who have unclear skin, right? This is the message that whatever uh, you know, blessing you've been given, see it as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, honor it, but also don't you know, see yourself above anyone because he could take it from you just as quickly as he gave it to you. And so that's what we, uh, when we mention these things, but of course we can dress nice and we, can, we should look presentable, right? And then cleanliness, we should all be aware of these things. We should teach our children from a young age to be mindful of keeping themselves clean and pure, practicing good hygiene, making sure that all of the areas that need to be taken care of before they come into public spaces are taken care of, right? So checking their smells. I, I have two boys, one of them is in, hitting the teenage years. As soon as he steps out the door, my question you can ask him is, did you put deodorant on? Did you put you know, some, what we call khushbu, and for the Urdu speakers, right? Which is like a perfume or a cologne or something. Because I don't want them to, I want them to follow the sunnah and I don't want them to offend people. We should teach this. And I can't tell you, as someone who does coming of age talks, I've had multiple requests from parents and teachers alike to say, please address this with the teens. Because we're failing our kids. We don't let them, we're, we're not doing a good job of this. It's a very uh, serious problem. I don't know why, but some of our, our youth are just not really taking care of their cleanliness. So we have to be on top of them about these things to follow the sunnah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the people of paradise will enter paradise with smooth and hairless skin. So no more waxing and shaving, ladies. We've got a lot of things to look forward to, inshallah. <laughs> natural kohal. Don't go get tattoos and all of that. Don't do that. We'll get the natural kohal in our eyes in Jannah, inshallah. And we'll be that ripe age of 30 or 33 years of age, inshallah, bi'ithnillah. And then the last one here, um, I love this. Right, this is from Ibn Abbas. He said, verily I love to beautify myself for my wife, just as I love for her to be beautify herself for me. Due to the saying of Allah Almighty, they have rights similar to those over them. Beautiful balance of our deen. Both are responsible to take care of one another. This is not just the burden of women to, to kill ourselves trying to look beautiful for our spouses while they let themselves go. Our, our, you know, we, we need to go back to this, right? And then of course, real beautif beautification is sourced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and directed inwardly, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely we have created the human being in the finest stature. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, this is his dua. Oh Allah, make what is within me better than my outward appearance and make my outward appearance righteous. Oh Allah, I ask you for the righteousness of what you give to the people of property, family and children without being misguided or misguiding others. So that was his dua, it should be our dua, that we want our inward beauty to be better than whatever outward beauty we have, right? And he also said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see the effects of his grace upon his servant, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loves to see that when he's given us blessings that we show them, but we show them with what? With refinement, dignity, gratitude. We don't show them with boasting and arrogance. We don't mimic what we see in this toxic culture that pits women against women, where you see a woman entering a space and she just, all her brand names are out and she thinks she's above everyone else. We don't do that. If you have blessings, of course you can share them, show them, but do it with the, that mindset that this is a, my way of showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not arrogating myself and presenting myself to people. 
The Prophet said, gentleness is not in something except that it adorns it. So that's an adornment that we need to all know, to be gentle, to be soft, to be kind in our words and our actions. That's real beautification, right? No amount of lip filler is gonna you know, make your lips beautiful if you have a toxic tongue, right? You can go and inject all you want and get all the Botox you want. But if you have you know, these character flaws, that's what we need to work on. And then Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah be pleased with him, said, and it is enough to realize Allah's beauty when we know that every internal and external beauty in this life and the next are created by him. So what of the beauty of their creator? Right. That's the beauty that we should seek. Here are some ayat for you if you wanted to screenshot these. Or but these are all reminders for all of us. And, is in, and of his signs is that he created for you from yourselves mates, that you may find tranquility in them, and he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, in that are signs of a people who give thought. So this is how we as women should, again, see ourselves, right? Um, and then this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his honored us in ways that I think some of us may not have yet realized, but inshallah, may Allah open our eyes to the fact that he mentions us in this way, right? Separates us from the men. So that aim, I go back to that, um, you know, the, the now, their mission that they wanted to bring forth the, or remind people of the humanity of women. Well here, what's more, a proof than this, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord the heaven, of, of the heavens and the universe is telling us, right, who we are and what we should aspire to. So I love this ayah, but even um, Leslie Hazelton, she acknowledged that this is really remarkable in that comparing it with the Bible, she said the Bible exclusively addresses men, right? Um, using the second and third person masculine, whereas the Quran here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is addressing women directly. So that is him elevating us, that is him honoring us. And this is again what we should aspire to. So in summary, sisters, and I'm done. Don't be seduced by the sinister and evil propaganda of Western culture and media that mean, manipulates girls and women to ascribe to a distorted, dehumanized, and destructive understanding of themselves. Women in Islam are honored for their entire being and not devalued for any part of our creation or their creation. By overemphasizing beauty, beautification, and sexuality, women may inadvertently deny their more essential purpose, the beautification of the soul, developing beautiful character, and striving for the pleasure of Allah, not worldly delights. And we must learn to nurture all of the gifts and blessings, right? Our intellects, relationships, talents, skills, interests, hobbies that Allah has given in order to find true fulfillment, not just focusing on the outward. So I'll leave you with this last slide. Remember, if anything's missing in your life, look around in the environment and make those changes. And then inshallah, you will come to bloom because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all of the means to do so. It's in our hands to change what needs to be changed, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, my dear sisters, how was lunch? Yes? Revived, nourished, ready for some more? Inshallah ta'ala. Well, let me tell you, if anybody is getting into that like after lunch slumber, Ustada Maryam is going to wake you up. <laughs> inshallah, let me tell you. I'm really excited to ask Ustada Maryam Amir Ibrahim to join us, inshallah, please. Inshallah, she's going to be speaking on the topic of better equal. And it's the topic I'll just tell you briefly. It says, women are the exact equals to men in every way and deserve everything that a man has. They should never settle for anything less, even if it means, my, means fighting and protesting everyone to get their way and rebelling against the status quo. Uh, quo. Now, you can understand from the message here is that we're going to, we're kind of pushing against all kinds of assumptions here today, aren't we? All right, alhamdulillah. So let me introduce to you Ustada Maryam. And she is um, Sheikha Maryam, mashallah, who received her master's degree in education from UCLA. And she holds a second bachelor's degree from the Islamic, in Islamic studies through the Azhar University. 
Maryam studied in Egypt, memorized the Quran, and has researched a variety of religious sciences ranging in Quranic exegesis, Islamic jurisprudence, prophetic narrative, and commentary, and women's rights within Islamic law for more than 15 years. She's featured in a video on a series of faith produced uh, by, by goodcast.net called the Maryam Amir Show. Ooh, mashallah. And she actively hosts women who have memorized the Quran from around the world to share their journeys on hashtag for mothers campaign. So please take a look at that, it's beautiful and amazing. And, and by the way, I said the Maryam, when we first had um, Ansari had recite, we asked the audience how many had never heard a woman reciter before, and we had a number of hands raised. So I'm really excited to tell everybody about the new app that Ustada Maryam is spearheading here that has in it, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> I told you you were not going to go to sleep in the session. <laughs> she is spearheading this amazing app of Quran that features women reciters of the Quran for the entire Mus'haf. So just like you can tap now, and usually what you get are some beautiful recitations of male reciters of the Quran. Now you can hear the entire Quran recited in different women's voices. MashaAllah. So, really excited about this, and I'll let her speak more to it. But before I do that, a couple of things to let you know in case you're wondering where to find her. Of course, on social media, mashallah. She's an instructor at Swiss and Hikmah Institutes, and also lectures for Al Maghrib, Discover You, and more. And has been interviewed as no surprise on many different outlets, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and I want to tell you some really cool things. She's also a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. So, inshallah, <laughs> we like to, as Ustad al Fadwa said, we like to read these entire bios and highlight different aspects of a person's life. And if it's okay, Ustad al Maryam, I mean, I say this too, kind of openly, you know, also wife and mother. And it's important to say the different aspects, especially for all people, but especially the younger sisters in our crowd, to see what balance may look like and what happens with different, uh, not hats, rather, hijabs that we juggle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, inshallah, the mic is yours. Barakallah fiki, thank you for joining us. I'm going to play a recitation for you, inshallah, and I'd like you to tell me who the reciter is. Abdul Basit, could you hear all the way in the back? All right, let me play another reciter for you, and I'd like you to tell me who this reciter is. <laughs> Hasari? Hasari? You're saying Hasari? Hasari. Okay, so you're saying the first one Abdul Basit, the second one is Hasari. Armin Shawi? They're not sure. Okay, any other guesses? Tablawi? You think it's a woman? That's crazy. What? All right, let's do one more. Okay, so I heard Minshawi again. Anyone else? Those are, those are the only two. I could only be doing those two. Okay. The first one is Abdul Basit. For all those who guess Abdul Basit, you're correct. The second was Haja Um Kulthum. Her name is Haja Um Kulthum bint Muhammad Zain, and she is Malaysian. <laughs> MashaAllah, Malaysian reciters. And then the third one is Sheikha Rahmas Abdullah. And she is a Malaysian reciter as well. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Sheikh Abdul Basit has a style that we all know. Sheikh Abdul Basit has this very specific style that is very clearly Sheikh Abdul Basit. But my Sheikh, Sheikh, Muhab, Sheikh Muhib Fulda, told me that Sheikh Abdul Basit was taught by Sheikh Um Sa'ad. Sheikh Um Sa'ad, who passed away around 2006, may Allah have mercy on her. 
She had the shortest senate in the world in one riwayah of a qira'ah. And so men and women would travel from Saudi, from Kuwait, from Palestine to go study under her because they wanted to be able to learn from the woman who had the shortest senate. Her teacher was Sheikha Kirima. Sheikha Kirima was in a time period where in Cairo, there were five women who were Quran reciters on Egypt's Quran channel. Right before that time period, we have a recording from 1911, Sheikha Mabruka, and I'd like to share with you her recitation. And I'd like you to tell me who she sounds like. sounded like that in 1911. Sheikh Abdul rahimahullah, passed away in the 1980s. He lived for about 60 years, a little more, rahmatullah When we ask the question, are women and men equal? Oftentimes, the reason why we ask that question, when women ask me this question, are men and women equal in Islam? The reason women ask me this question is often because women don't feel seen, they don't feel heard. They don't feel like we don't feel like our rights are given to women. As Dr. Rania so eloquently talked about, we are often put in particular boxes, as Asada Hussai mentioned. Oftentimes, we are asking this question because we don't see the impact of women's voices on our scholarship, on our leadership, throughout our history. And so sometimes when we're hearing about how we're supposed to be the ideal Muslim woman, and it's only in one particular lens over and over and over, and what if we don't fit that lens for whatever reason? We struggle with that question. And at the core of the question is where are women in the first place? When we talk about Khadija radiallahu anha, when we speak about Khadija to individuals who are not Muslim, what are the mega speaking points you often hear? She was a businesswoman. She was older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was a widow. She proposed to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at how empowered women are in Islam. A widow or a woman who is divorced? A woman who is older than her husband by a lot. A woman who is a businesswoman. A woman who wants to propose to a man. In our community, are any of those words regularly words that we use to talk about how wonderful the women in our community are? Do we speak with that same passion and love that we speak about Khadija radiallahu anha? Or do we tokenize those items, express them to say, look at how beautiful Islam is, but women who are struggling in our community do not feel that same love? And that's where that question comes from. When you look at Khadija radiallahu anha, and the way that she was the woman who supported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received the revelation, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Who did he run to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He ran to Khadija radiallahu anha, and we know about this part of her story. Someone who comforted him, someone who cared for him, someone who held him, covered him, 
covered him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know about her as a wife. We know about her financially supporting the da'wah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know about her and the mothering that she cared so much for her children, radiallahu anha. But do we know of her as a political rebel? Because Khadija radiallahu anha didn't simply accept a message that said, change your private belief and tell no one. Khadija radiallahu anha accepted a belief which brought societal and economic transformation. That is a political revolution. And she put her body quite literally on the line. She literally died because of this message, radiallahu anha. And yet when we speak about her and we don't speak to the reality that we experience as women in the same way that the ummahat or that the companions who were women experience, sometimes we feel so far removed from them. When we look at Asma, the daughter of, of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhuma, many of us know that she was known as the who? Yes, the woman who had, to, who had these two belts, she ripped her own clothing so that she can help provide provision for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr. We know this about her. Did you know that she's also in her third trimester of pregnancy when she was doing this? She was physically assaulted by the people of the Quraysh to give up the information, questioning her, to give up the information of who? To them, to them fugitives, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and radiallahu anhu. They were seeking political asylum. Who aided them? Asma radiallahu anha. When we look at the women who came to Aqaba, there were women who were present Women who came to pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. This is a political act. When we look at Asma radiallahu anha, bint Umais. Asma bint Umais, she's often known as the wife of Ja'far radiallahu anhu. And after he passed away, she later married Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And after he passed away and she was nursing him as he was sick towards the end of his life radiallahu anhuma, she then married Ali radiallahu anhu. She was this woman who was, subhanAllah, married to the best of men. And yet, if we've heard of her, it's often only because of who she married, which is enough, honestly, that is amazing. But she helped change the culture of how the people who migrated from Abyssinia to Medina were seen. Asma radiallahu anha migrated from Mecca and then she migrated to Abyssinia. And then from Abyssinia, she migrated about seven years later to Medina. And when she moved to Medina, and she was sitting with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar radiallahu anhuma, Umar radiallahu anhu realized who she is. And you know what he said to her? That she was from the people of the ship. And he asserted that Umar radiallahu anhu and his companions were there before her. And so he said, we got here first. We have more of a right to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than you do. Umar radiallahu anhu is promised paradise. Shaytan runs away from Umar. It's acceptable to be terrified of saying anything in front of Umar radiallahu anhu. Or out of humility because of the maqam of Umar radiallahu anhu. But Asma radiallahu anha, she didn't say, you're making me feel like I don't belong here and I'm not going to say anything about it. She didn't say, you're right, men do have more of a right to the masjid than women. Do, you're right. Women shouldn't come to the masjid at all. She didn't say, oh, women who are converts don't have more of a right than women who are born Muslim. She didn't say, oh, women who are married have more of a right than women who are not. Women who have children, more of a right than women who don't. All of these realities that our community, women who are extroverted are absolutely never pious because of your personality in and of itself. These messages that we so often hear in our community, that Umar radiallahu anhu, when he said this to her, she responded with strength. She spoke about how she was angered by his words. She got angry. And she said that she's not going to eat or drink until she goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tells him exactly what Umar radiallahu anhu said. She said that we were in Abyssinia while you were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were hungry and they were tired and they were not being taught directly by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar radiallahu anhu and his companions had all of those privileges. And then to say she doesn't belong with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as much 
radiallahu anhu, obviously promised paradise. May Allah honor us with being with him. Radiallahu anhu. Omar's story is so amazing because you can quite literally see a transformation of someone who didn't value women to someone who became such an advocate for women. She goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's response is to say that Omar radiallahu anhu and his companions do not have more of a right than Asma and her companions. That Umar anhu and his companions made hijrah once. The people of the ship made hijrah twice. They are double rewarded. And so when Asma shared this narration with, narration with Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and the companions who came from the ship, they were overjoyed and they asked to hear it over and over and over again. They kept coming to her asking to hear this narration. She changed the way that people saw the people of the ship because she used her agency of voice. She saw that she was needed in a space and she asserted her right to be there. Radiallahu anha. When we look at Nusayba, radiallahu anha, which everyone knows as the defender of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who defended him in Uhud, everywhere he looked, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, from the left to the right, she was there defending him. He, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, she, in, she participated in seven battles, and in one of them, her arm was cut off. And why this is so important is because then she became a woman with a disability. And there were men and women in the time of the Prophet ﷺ who had disabilities, like Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. He was the mu'adhan of the Prophet ﷺ with Bilal radiallahu anhu. And Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was blind, and the Prophet ﷺ put him in charge of the city of Medina on more than one occasion when he left the city, ﷺ, asking him to lead the salah. And he died as a shaheed, being the flag bearer of the Muslims. Despite the fact that he was blind, he was in the front lines. When we talk about the example the Prophet ﷺ set for his community, he took those who were targeted for their vulnerabilities in the Quraysh's time. And he put them in leadership. And we see that that changed the culture of how people viewed women, how people viewed individuals with disabilities, how people saw believers. That your belief, your taqwa, your work for the community is where your worth is. And when we look at these examples, Dr. Asma Ziyada, she completed a book that her father, who was a sheikh, began writing, and he passed away before he could finish it, rahimahullah. And the book is called The Political Role of Women in the Time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Righteous Khulafa. The Political Role of Women in the Time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Righteous Khulafa. And she spoke about how many times when we are introduced to women who are a part of the companions, we don't necessarily know them as we just spoke about them in a political lens, for example. Because oftentimes the person writing a book is not looking for that particular lens. Books are written and then they are taught and then the students learn them and then they teach them and then they're incorporated into curriculum. So if you have someone who's writing a book and their lens is the Prophet Sallallahu kindness. They will speak about those different aspects, but maybe only leave that part of the hadith that's necessary to address in the, in the context. And Abu Shukka, who wrote Tahrir al-Mar'a, which by the way was just translated, the first volume is just out on Amazon. I don't know how the, what the translation is actually, um, but look up... Uh, maybe freedom in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, something like, something like that. The translation is just being published panel after all these years. Abu Shaqqa's intention, he wrote a book addressing the many mis mis misunderstood ahadith related to women and women's roles. And when he wanted to write this book, he actually had intended to write a seerah book. And so he went through Bukhari and Muslim looking for authentic ahadith to include in the seerah, book that he was writing. As he's going through Bukhari and Muslim, he's coming after one hadith after another, coming up through one hadith after another that has to do with the woman companions and how they spoke to men, how they were involved in society, how they were active in the masjid. And he had never come across these hadith before. 
And so he started calling up his friends in different factions of Egypt. He called friends he had who were part of the Salafis and the Sufis and all these different aspects of Egypt. And he said, have you ever come across these ahadith that are in Bukhari and Muslim? And they all said, no, they had no idea. So he shifted from writing a Sira book to writing a book on women's rights. And it was banned in Saudi Arabia. Despite the fact that the very first volume only talks about the ahadith from Bukhari and Muslim and the ayat in the Quran that address women. When we look at how women have been presented through history, we can understand why sometimes we have one context presented and that's all we also learn. So when we look at the ahadith, for example, there is a hadith you might have heard of the Prophet wasallam walking with his wife Safiya, radiallahu anha. And they're walking together, and there are these other companions who see them, and the Prophet ﷺ does what? Who knows? What is it? Yes, exactly. He's like, he, tell, he, he, he clarifies وسلم, that he's walking with his wife. What context have you heard this hadith in? Yes, exactly. Like, be careful not to get involved in something that could be misunderstood. Be clear to people what your intentions are, especially when it comes to men and women interacting with one another. The Prophet ﷺ was so careful that he clarified for his own wife, radiallahu anha, and he's a Prophet ﷺ. Is this the context which you've typically heard this hadith in? Why was Sophia with the Prophet ﷺ? Does anyone know? Yes, she went to visit him while he was making itikaf, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She just wanted to spend time with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Itikaf is a very, you know, it's a very sacred experience. I don't like using the word sacred experience. I should say it's a time where we are very quiet. We make dhikr. We don't engage in talking for fun. It's a very focused time of worship. Sophia radiallahu anha comes to just spend time with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She went to the masjid on her own. She didn't need someone to accompany her to the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell her, oh no, this isn't a good time, I'm in, I'm in itikaf ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ spoke with her and then didn't say, have a good time walking home ﷺ. To spend more time with her, he walked her home ﷺ. Doesn't that put a different dimension on her role as a wife and his role as a husband? Why is it when we talk about that hadith, it's only in the aspect of be cautious of shaitan. When we could look back at the entire lens and say, and look at how our relationships should be. And look at how a mother of the believer chose to go to the masjid for no other reason than she wanted to visit her husband. And that was fine. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's take another hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha when she praised the woman of the Ansar for what? Their shyness never prevented them from asking. What is the context of that hadith? Why did she say that? Does anyone know? Close. Yes. Thank you. She was asking about intercourse. And so Aisha radiallahu anha made this statement. Have you ever known, maybe a few people thought periods, something related to something purifying, but has anyone ever learned that this hadith was related to this question? Raise your hands if you've heard that before. One, two, three, four, five, six. When we lose context, we then don't know that the woman companions ask these questions because they themselves had these needs, had these, these, these experiences to the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we look at Atiqa radiallahu anha, she was the wife of Umar radiallahu anha. And she loved going to the masjid. And did Umar love that she would go to the masjid? No, he didn't want her to actively go to the masjid. And that wasn't a religious edict. It was because of his personality. And we need to separate that out. Because when we hear about this aspect, we often hear, do you see Amma radiallahu anhu, such a righteous man? He didn't even want his own wife to go to the masjid. Do you hear it in that context? That she was in the masjid when he was stabbed, radiallahu anhu. That when he was stabbed, he passed away, inshallah, martyred from that wound, radiallahu anhu, and she was in the masjid when he was stabbed. Wouldn't you think that if someone is married to 
the ruler of the Muslims, and she was in the masjid when he was murdered, or led to the murder of him, that maybe she wouldn't go to the masjid anymore out of respect for his wishes? Would you think that makes sense? That's certainly the context that I've heard her example be put in. But Ibn Hajar mentions that before she married Omar, it was put in the contract that he could not prevent her from the masjid. And when she had a conversation about Umar radiallahu anhu, with Umar radiallahu anhu, like why, 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 she, she asked, why doesn't he stop me? And his response was the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do not prevent the maidservants of God from going to the houses of God. His personal choice, his personal desire did not prevent her, he did not prevent her from accessing her rights in Islam. He wouldn't put his own personal desire over the command of the Prophet So when we look at Atiqa radiallahu anha, when she got remarried to Az-Zubair, did she not go to the masjid because she wanted to respect her Umar radiallahu anhu's wishes even though he had passed away? She put it in her contract again to Az-Zubair that you cannot stop me from going to the masjid. Context is so critical because when we hear a hadith on women, oftentimes it sounds like there are a lot of questions women have because it seems like we don't understand how that, what that actually means. But was the Prophet Wasallam maybe saying it to a group of men? And yes, of course, it applies to women still. But maybe the wording would have been different if he was speaking to women, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Looking at the context is so critical because it allows us to go from asking the question, are men and women equal, to realizing that women were actively a part of shaping the political, the socio-economical, the religious society of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we recognize that context, we can then also see why we have such a vast history of women's scholarship in Islam. For example, Imam al-Dhahabi, the great, uh, excuse me, Ibn Hajar, the great Ibn Hajar, he studied with 53 women scholars. Imam al sakhawi 68 women scholars were his teachers. Um Muhammad, Sheikha Um Muhammad, she was the, the, the Sheikha of the, the masjid in Damascus. Excuse me, in Baghdad, in Baghdad. Aisha bint Abdul Hadi, she was the sheikha of the masjid in Damascus. There is a, a, subhanAllah, a beautiful narration from Ibn Rushd who mentions that he used to learn from a sheikha named Sheikha Fatima in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she would rest her back. You know the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is buried? There's like an air, it's something outside of the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, kind of like a barrier. She would rest her back on that as she would teach hadith. And men would come and listen to her, and women would come and listen and learn hadith from her. And then she would give them ijazah by her hand. The, 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 the examples of women in scholarship are too numerous to count. And Sheikh Akram Nadawi has done so much research in this. SubhanAllah, you can read Al Muhadithat in English. Al-Wafa' bil Asma in Arabic. He has a huge encyclopedia of women scholars. But this understanding of women's roles and who they were, as Sheikh Akram actually mentions, has shifted over time, oftentimes due to reasons unrelated to Islam in and of itself, or interpretations within Islam that become the, the, the policy that then shift the way generations look at a particular issue. So for example, when Muslims started learning about Greek philosophy, they started taking the Greek literature, translating it into Arabic, and Greek literature, we all know this talking point because we often like to talk about it in our Dawah seminars, they didn't used to see women in the same way as men. They used to ask if women even had souls. They questioned if women should even be given an education. Do any of those questions seem familiar though? When we look at when they were translated, those who followed the translations and merged them with Islamic literature started seeing women in the same light. And so when the rulers of the Muslim Ummah shifted and became those who followed this particular aspect, they closed the schools that women used to teach in. They closed the schools that women used to learn in. 
What do you think that's going to do to a generation, to two generations, to three generations? It literally becomes, oh, you're just a Western feminist progressive Muslim who's trying to change Islam because you're saying that women can teach. No, this is traditional Islam. We've allowed all of these political conversations to impact the way we see women. So perhaps you are the product, actually. Perhaps you should be asking yourself why you're making those claims. Because when we look at the time of the Prophet ﷺ until now, we have too many accounts in history of women who taught. And of course they did so in a way that was within proper Islamic etiquette. Of course they did so within the guidelines of Islam. And I feel like saying that is redundant because it's obvious these are scholars of Islam. But even those points are questioned at times. When we look at the fact that women's recitation in particular, there's a difference of opinion on women being Quran reciters in public. But these countries like Egypt, let me tell you, for example, like I started sharing with you the recitations of women from Malaysia, where women recite all the time. SubhanAllah, we are so blessed, inshallah, be coming out with this Quran app called Qari'a, Women Quran Reciters app. It's a Quran Reciters app for women to listen to women's recitation. And I've had conversations with the Qari'as. We have over 60 Qari'as, alhamdulillah. And they're from all over the world, mashallah, from, from Kenya to um, Indonesia, from uh, Spain to Somalia, from Australia to the United States, everywhere, mashallah. And these women oftentimes, when I mention, you know, we're getting pushback for the app, even though it's a woman's app, we're getting pushback. And they ask me, but why? And I'm like, because women are not Quran reciters in public. And they're like, we've never heard that before. Their responses, our, our scholars never said that before. And I think sharing that perspective is important because we can choose to follow an opinion that's absolutely acceptable, but we should also share that there's another one. And in Egypt in particular, do you know why it's not common to hear women reciters? Because in the 1980s, Sheikh Al-Sa'adani, he wrote a book that was um, introed by Sheikh Al-Sha'arawi, the great scholar of tafsir. Sheikh Al-Sha'arawi wrote the introduction to Sheikh Al-Sa'adani's book, Heavenly Voices. And in this book, he talks about how Um Muhammad was a sheikha who would recite the Quran for the Ottoman ruler in the palace. And she's now buried next to Imam al-Shafi'i. May Allah have mercy on both of them. And that women were reciters in the hundreds. They were teachers in the hundreds. And in the, in the mid-1900s, after the world, when World War II started, Azhar passed a fatwa that it was haram to listen to a woman reciting the Quran. So women stopped reciting on the radio. And since then, Darul Iftat has actually changed that fatwa. But what's important to realize is that at that time, subhanAllah, there's a reciter, his name is Sheikh Muhammad Ash-Shu'a'shi. <laughs> can't say his name correctly, please forgive me, Sheikh. May Allah have mercy on you so much. That was so awkward, why did I say it? May Allah have mercy on the Sheikh. Please forgive me for not saying it correctly. He was the first Egyptian who recited in Masjid al-Aqsa in a professional capacity. And subhanAllah, when he, when he was, um, when he heard the, 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 the ban, he used to recite the Quran with Sheikh Munira Abdu and Sheikh Karima Adliya on the radio. And he said, my heart will never be at ease until women go back to being Quran reciters on the radio as they used to be in the golden era of Egypt. And the reason I want to share that with you is because our grandparents wouldn't have grown up knowing about their existence. But they existed. And we don't have to take the opinion that it's permissible. We can believe it's haram and live that, and that's okay, that's absolutely acceptable. I just want to share with you that our ummah has gone through a lot of different times in which we've seen women's voices in different ways. Knowing that we've had those differences is helpful for a 19-year-old girl who's been told since she was 13 that she cannot memorize the Qur'an because the Imam will not teach women and he's the only Imam of the Masjid. For that 19-year-old girl, for the 40-year-old women who have told me that when they stopped reciting Qur'an was when they hit puberty. And the only person in their Masjid who could teach was the Imam and he said, I'm not comfortable teaching women. And they were so impacted by that that they started feeling more and more distant from Islam. 
And they've told me that now that they've been hearing women recite the Quran again in their 40s for the first time, they're opening the Quran again. That's a generational reality. That's having children. That's going to 60 and 70 and 80 and maybe having grandchildren. And not opening the Quran or never reciting it out loud in your private space because you don't know that as a woman, the Quran is for you. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how women were present. And he recorded women making specific statements for a reason. Like for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the daughters of the Shaykhun Kabir, who are the answer to the dua of Musa alayhi salam as he's asking for Allah to send him something. They come and they meet him and then she, one of them goes back to her father and she says what? قَالَتْ يَا أَبَدِ اسْتَأْجِرْ Hire him! Scholars of tafsir mention Allah didn't have to say that line. That line is not necessary to understand the story. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say it? So that women know that they were included in financial matters. When the Queen of Sheba is asked about what to do, when she's asking for advice from her advisors what to do, about Sulaiman alayhi salam's letter. She talks about what muluk do when they come into the, to the, uh, to the, to the new land and they ruin the land. And then there's an ayah right after she speaks and it says, And it could be as if she's saying, and that's what they do. But scholars of tafsir say that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirming her intelligence by saying, yes, that is what they do. That it's exactly, and this woman is depicted as a righteous ruler, that is exactly what they do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recorded the voices of women in the Quran for a reason. Whenever you, as a woman, may feel like you're not sure of your status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or you're confused, or you disagree, and that's okay, it's okay to disagree. But when you're questioning that part of yourself as a woman, I've been asked by Muslim women, sincerely asking with tears in their eyes, did Allah create women to be like somewhere between an animal and a man? Is that our level with Allah? And if that's what Allah wants, that's fine. That's, I accept that because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, but is that it? When we have an eight-year-old asking that question, and then she becomes a 28-year-old who has internalized that, and then she potentially raises children with that internalization, where does our entire ummah go? We often talk about the next generation and Islam for the next generation. If women are feeling disenfranchised in this generation, who are the great-grandchildren? Who are they tracing it back to? To save the future of our ummah, we need to support women right now. Because whether or not she or you are ever going to be mothers, because subhanAllah, Allah has willed each and every one of us to have a different role for a reason. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse I end every time with, because I want you to remember, <laughs> He has chosen you. And Imam al-Tabari mentions he's chosen you for a quality that he sees inside of you, even if you don't see it yourself. He created you to be a woman of this ummah in a time where women are struggling with being women, in a time where we're being attacked by every ideology, at a time where everyone else is welcoming you onto their understanding. He's invited you to fight now. And right now, and honestly forever, maybe absolutely no one will know our names. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget. And the angels who roam the earth looking for the people who come together in his name, coming together and surrounding you with tranquility and taking your names up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't forget. And one day we are going to be those women in history. So the question isn't whether or not your voice matters. And the question certainly isn't whether or not we are equal to men. 
The question is, what are we going to do to make the future generations of Islam, of Muslims, look and say, the women of the past changed the course of history because of their strength in their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you all are deserving of being one of those people. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashiru wa na ilaha ila anna astaghfir kim natu wa laik salamu alaykum wa Takbir. Allah ibarak fiki. MashaAllah. Ustada Maryam, MashaAllah. Right, sisters? You're well awake now. MashaAllah. I hope. Say astaghfirullah. And absolutely, I hope everybody. Is the app being uh, downloadable soon? Can it be downloaded? Allah, the app will be out in Ramadan. Inshallah. Allah. Ramadan. All right. Alhamdulillah. Well, my dear sisters, I hope, inshallah, in this. Ramadan, you'll be listening to the app and all the different women reciters, mashallah, as you kind of read through your mushaf and listen along and the ibad and worship you do. Just really quickly, Ustada Maria mentioned to us a book. I want you to know what it is. There's, I know it's currently being translated, the different volumes, but it's called The Character of Muslim Woman, Woman's Emancipation During the Prophet's Lifetime. So if you're trying to find it, that's the name of it, and it's translated by Adil Salahi. So take a look, inshallah, because I think some of the things you were quoting, Ustada Maryam, is from, from the book. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu fiki. Inshallah, now we're going to ask Dr. Amina Darwish to come forward, inshallah, and join us on the stage. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about her topic and then who she is. Mashallah. So um, Dr. Amina is also known as Imamina. <laughs> <laughs> and she start, and she's the Associate Dean for Religious Life. Actually, that's where you started, I think. You started there, right, in Stanford. So I have the real pleasure of having her on campus with me, alhamdulillah. So she's, she's the Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life and the Advisor on Muslim Life. Um, she started at, at Stanford last year, alhamdulillah. And she um, previously served as the Muslim Life Coordinator for Columbia University. So we got her from New York, mashallah. Happy that you're here, alhamdulillah. She's had a decade of professional experience working with the Muslim community and also brings years of experience uh, with building and serving in nonprofit organizations. She has a unique blend of understanding of different cultures within the Muslim community while staying grounded in traditional Islamic scholarship. Now, sisters, she's our chaplain on campus, but she's also a PhD in engineering. <laughs> <laughs> of chemical engineering, alhamdulillah, before she switched careers. I, I'm telling you, we read all the bios because there are gems hidden in all these bios, but otherwise the stethas and the teachers themselves wouldn't share with you, so we're doing that. And she's very passionate, mashallah, about ethics, meaning, service to STEM disciplines, and she also strives to create cultures of openness and consistent kindness into the communities she serves. I love that. She's earned Ijazas, traditional Islamic teaching certificates from Qalam, and also from the Critical Loyalty Seminary. And she also has an Ijazah in the 10 Qira'at of Qur'an, mashallah. Dr. Darwish, Dr. Amina has studied individually under different scholars in different parts of the world, and she's taught at the college level coursework on Islam and Muslims, and we're really happy and honored to have her with us. She's speaking on, I should probably get this, there we go. <laughs> She's speaking on better than, question mark. And this is a subject where we chose, you know, uh, to talk about where here it says, are women better than men? You know, are they better than men in every way? Do they not need men at all? Are men misogynistic and just aim to suppress and oppress women in every way? Women must live to fight men. Women are only held back because of systems of oppression like patriarchy, and we must live to dismantle them all. Obviously, there's a lot of sarcasm built into this, mashallah, as we haven't noticed yet. And we are questioning assumptions, we are questioning lots of things that you hear, and I would say that I hear all the time on a college campus, which is why a college chaplain is the best person to talk about this. Farakallah, Fiki. Thank you, Dr. Amin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu salam, ashifu mursaleen, in the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Can I just take a second? Alhamdulillah for everyone that worked to put this together. Alhamdulillah for the generations of women that brought us here. Alhamdulillah for all of the effort of everyone that 
made this happen. Alhamdulillah, for everyone's intention in being here, Ya Allah, accept everyone's intentions, accept everyone's dua that's made in this space, Alhamdulillah. I, I'm, I know I'm not the only one. I'm so used to being like the token woman on the panel where there are like four men and they're like, tell us about marriage. And I'm like, ew. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, as I was listening to the talks, I was just like, subhanAllah, so amazed. I'm so used to like, okay, you have to have all the answers for all the women's stuff. And subhanAllah, just, I, I'm getting, I was getting really emotional, and then I was like, alhamdulillah, listening to, to Sheikha Maryam, and then I'm telling my squad of students, and I'm like, I don't want to go up anymore. And they're like, you'll do great, alhamdulillah. So like, anytime you're feeling like you're doubting yourself, have a squad of women, it really, really helps, alhamdulillah. <laughs> So I actually wanted to start with an ayah, and this is ayah 36 in Surah Yaseen. Subhan al-lazhi khalaq al-azwaj kullaha mimma tunbitu al-ard wa min anfusihim wa mimma la ya'lamun. Glory be to the one who created pairs from everything, created all of the pairs from what comes out of the earth, from themselves and from what they don't know. Because I feel like sometimes we ask this question, what is the wisdom in creating humanity into like these buckets? Like why? But subhanAllah, if you're part of a pair, you are inherently incomplete. And Allah, the one, is inherently complete and inherently perfect. The existence of men and women on earth, whether we acknowledge it or not, is honoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's oneness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. Am I doing this wrong? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Alhamdulillah. Cool, what was the Sprint commercial? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Najm says, وَأَنَّهُ خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ ذَكَرُ الْأُنْثَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the testaments of who, who he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, I just want to pause, he being a, a mess, like just a limitation of the language, not a limitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond gender, is beyond needing us, hence the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-wahid al-ahad al-fard al-samad, the unique, the one. The word Allah in, in Arabic literally means the one and only God. It's a word that inherently cannot be pluralized. SubhanAllah, so incredible. But I want to talk about, this is so, I wanted to talk a little bit about the theory, the current situation that we're in, and then hopefully the remedies from our tradition. So the theory makes a lot of sense. So over, like in a number of places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ مِنْ ذَكَرًا وَأُنْتَ And whoever does good deeds, male or female, sometimes it says, وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ And they are a believer. But over and over again, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions male and female, mentions them together and says, whoever does good deeds. Again, the focus on the action. Whoever is actually doing these actions, they are equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence the discussion on equality. But there's another ayah, when Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam's mother is having a child, she's saying, Ya Allah, I've dedicated my child. And they're going to serve you. And then she has a daughter. And she says, قَالَتْ رَبِّنِي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى She's like, Ya Allah, it's a girl. وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعْتُ Allah knows what it's like. It's not like Allah didn't know it was a girl. And it says, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى And the male is not like the female. And I feel like there's a beautiful subtlety in that. Because as we aspire, we don't aspire for equality in the sense of we're exactly the same. We aspire for equity. And I, I know it's a subtle difference, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Because if we set men as the standard, it's an inherently losing proposition for women to always try to aspire to be men. I don't want to be a man. Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy being a woman. It's, I don't want to be a man. But also, in that moment, Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam is such a beautiful example that her mother, is, she filled a role that only a woman could. And prepared her community for a role that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam would later take on. She was part of that journey. Radiallahu anha, or alayhi salam, subhanAllah. I just think it's so beautiful when we talk about her. I just, subhanAllah, I'm just like drowning in all of the things that were said before. When we talk about patriarchy, if I say patriarchy is a hierarchy where I'm holding one group above the other, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. Is it just to create half of humanity inherently subservient to the other? Or is there actually a balance? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us a people of balance. And I want to point out that this lack of balance is not just destructive to women, it's also destructive to men. And there's so many things in the physical universe, like most stars are, I'm going to nerd out for a second. Most stars are actually two star pairs that are rotating around each other and they're balancing each other out. You know that game where you hold hands and you go really fast in a circle? If it's an adult and a child, the child is flying. <laughs> And you're, if you're balanced, you're just, you're going around in a circle. That lack of balance is inherently destructive to both groups. And I want to make, like, point this out. In American society, single men usually don't get touched. Like, don't get hugged. Don't get any kind of physical affection unless if they are in a sexual relationship. How destructive is that to people's psyche? But also, how destructive is that for our society that the only outlet they have is a sexual relationship? I'm saying this to say that this isn't just bad for the women, it's also bad for the men. The examples of women during the time of the Prophet ﷺ are so endless. And mashallah, we heard so many of them. I wanted to, subhanAllah, in Mecca, Mecca was a lot more patriarchal because it was based on who got to travel and trade. It was dangerous to trade. The men held all of the power, had all of the political power and the financial power. This is why financial literacy for women is so important because it balances things out. When they got to Medina, they were people that would, they were farmers and the family would farm together. It was a far more balanced society. It's no surprise that Mecca kicked the Prophet ﷺ out and Medina took him in. That's not a coincidence. And subhanAllah, he arrives in Medina and you can see the cultural shift. SubhanAllah, there's a moment where Umar told him, he's like, remember when we were in Mecca and we would talk and the women would listen and now we can't get a word in edgewise? Like, what happened to us? He's like, I don't, like, He's, his brain's melting. He's like, I don't know what to do with this. And it's funny because his wife like talks back to him. He's like, wait, what, what, what's happening? This is new. What's happening? And she tells him, you're not better than the Prophet. So I send him, your daughter talks back to him. And he's like, his brain melts. He runs to Hafsa. He's like, what are you doing? Just like, we all do that. It's not just me. <laughs> SubhanAllah, this was the norm. This was the standard. He's saying this to the Prophet. So I send him. It was actually a time where the Prophet so I send him was really upset. And as soon as he said that, the Prophet, he pulled the Prophet ﷺ out of being upset because he couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> like, it's like, yes, that, subhanAllah, that balance is so beautiful. There was a battle called the Battle of Mu'ta. The Muslims went, there were 3,000 of them. They were fighting the Byzantine Empire. They were fighting like 100,000. It was such an intense battle. SubhanAllah, this is right after Khan al-Marid becomes Muslim. He, they engineer this way to like safely retreat. They run back to Medina. And they're on the outskirts of Medina and the women of Medina come out to them because this is the first time in Islamic history that the Muslims have left a battle. The women come out and say, Ya furrar, ya furrar, you cowards, you cowards who ran away, you're not allowed home. And the Prophet ﷺ comes out and intervenes and he says, Balhumul Qurrar, Balhumul Qurrar, there'll be another round, I promise, please let them home. And the Sahama said, we were far more afraid of the women of Medina than we were of the Byzantine Empire that we were like fighting the day before. This, our strength as believing women, this is what made Medina. This is what made the community that took in the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever loves the Ansar, the people that took him in in Medina is, one of the believe, is a believer. And whoever hates the Ansar is a hypocrite. SubhanAllah. This is the weight of the women in our tradition. And stories like this are endless. I want to talk about part of how we ended up where we are now. So right now, I wanted to actually start off with, with Surah Al-Qasas because part of the trauma that has happened, not just in the Muslim community, but really all over the world was the, this colonialism. Our grandparents kicked out the colonizers, the military colonizers. There's still economic colonization that's happening all over the world. And colonization is not unknown to this particular piece of land. And at the heart of all of this is white supremacy. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he's describing the pharaonic system in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Qasas, and the surah, the surah is actually called, sometimes translated to the stories, but usually translated to um, the narratives. And it takes the narrative of Pharaoh in one ayah, it says this is, because it's not even complex, it's like this is it, and then the, the majority of the surah is actually telling the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. But in this ayah, it says, Pharaoh rose in the land, he divided people into groups, and here the word that it's using, Shia versus Ta'ifa, it's a group with a distinct identity. He, he convinced them they were different from each other. And then he oppressed one of the groups. And the word Ta'ifa is just a subgroup. It's actually, they're one group from the many groups. They're not actually different. He kills, he killed the men and he kept the women alive. Certainly he was one of those people who caused corruption. I think it's important to talk about how the system that we have now is actually specifically gendered and treated men with differently from women. And sometimes part of the dichotomies we're seeing in our own Muslim community is because the, the oppression that we experienced and our, and our parents lived through, the trauma that we experienced communally was different whether you were a man or a woman. I also want to point out that this level of oppression is different based on the other rung of society that Pharaoh divided people into. Based on your race, you might experience more or less of this. But because you're put into this group, everybody's competing to be the model minority. I really don't care if Muslims become the model minority. I care if Muslims actually bring justice. Because that's what we're called to do. And if we work to compete in a system that is oppressing to other people, we're, ne we're never going to win. Why would we? Why would Allah ever put barakah in a system where we've just wholesale accepted oppression of other people? And because the Muslim Muslims in America are actually the most ethnically diverse religious group in the country, that means that we're not just accepting oppression for other people, we're accepting oppression within our own communities. Why would we ever do that? That's not the point of this. And I also want to point out that when we talk about like this post-colonialist reality that we're all living in, sometimes, oftentimes you see the same objectification of women that, that Ustadh al so, like spoke about just takes, you know, like this religious veneer we're objectifying women, but now we're like, you should wear a hijab so that you don't attract the men. This is my act of worship. How do you make this about you? Like, really, how do you make this about you? Women are told in society that our value is based on what we look like, and this is my act of worship to remind me I'm more important spiritually than I am physically. If you find women attractive, you lower your gaze. That's your responsibility. In fact, that's my right upon you. I have a right for you to not objectify me. SubhanAllah, how did we twist this? You guys have all seen this. It was like for a while, it was this horrendous meme. I hated it. There's like an, a lollipop that's covered and what you guys know what I'm talking about. And then there's a lollipop with ants and they're like, this is why you wear hijab. And I'm like, women are lollipops, men are ants. Like this whole thing is horrendous. But how are you then taking religious language to do exactly the same system of oppression, to try to cover up Pharaoh's system, to cover up the white supremacist system. Dali Mujahid recently posted this. She said, we look at beauty and we think it's, it's, it's rare. It's not. It's commonplace. The dua, when you look into a meter, mirror of like, Ya Allah, the same way that you've beautified my outer, beautify my inner. I'm already saying, Ya Allah, you've made me beautiful on the outside. And if you're insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, who are you insulting? Also, a lot of our beauty standards in our own community are based on white supremacist ideals. I get into this argument so much with Egyptian women, they're like, curly hair is ugly. I'm like, we're North African. Most of us have curly hair. At what point did you decide this was ugly? And they're like, what's your problem? I'm like, I have a problem. When our colonizer says, I am beautiful, and you are not, and you say yes. They came around and took down cities that were far more civilized than them and called them savages. The tragedy is when we believe we're actually savages. 
This isn't us going back. When I'm fighting for women's rights, I had a, I actually recently broke up with my therapist not to find a new one. But because I was telling her, I'm like, I really care about women's rights. She's like, you clearly have progressive values. I'm like, no, I have very traditional values, like specifically 1,400 years old. They are very traditional. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I <I'm> fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is true across the board. Women all over the world are using this like bleach junk on their, like you're actually putting chemicals on your faces that harm you to look like you're oppressor? Why? And I'm not saying this of like, oh wait, women aren't beautiful. Every woman's beautiful. White, black, and every shade in between. Again, who are you insulting? Are we really going to go around insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beauty and his creation? Walayadu billah. Subhanallah. Sorry, I know I'm not on the rings. Alhamdulillah. I feel like we wouldn't be here if we, there wasn't misogyny in the Muslim community. We actually wouldn't have a conference. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I really think it's important to talk about. Because I, 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 I've, I've said this before, I've gotten kicked out of more masajid than not. Because if I go into a masjid and you're like, there's no space for women, I'm like, okay, yell at me when I'm done. Allahu Akbar. Because the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you can't prevent me from being here. The, the narration that Maryam mentioned, that subhanAllah, after, after the, his father passed away, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah the son of Umar, went to his mom and said, why do you keep coming back? And she's like, so what's the reason Umar didn't tell me not to come? And he got ashamed and turned away. Because as her son, if the Prophet ﷺ spoke, he doesn't have a right to tell you otherwise. And the irony is like, I remember when COVID was like first happened and they're like, okay, we'll open the masjid and we'll be socially distanced and we'll do this and we'll do that. But the women shouldn't come because it's not mandatory on them. And I'm like, it was never mandatory on us. Still the Prophet ﷺ told you, you can't ban me from the masjid. Your misogyny is showing. And when they're like, oh no, this isn't about misogyny, this is fiqh. I'm like, okay, so how is the commandment of the Prophet ﷺ not fiqh? How is one statement fiqh and not the other one? When we're talking about these things, I think it's so important that subhanAllah, we are mindful of this is our tradition. Am I submitting to it or am I trying to fit it in a box? And this is where the root of patriarchy in the Muslim community is. If you accept hierarchy at home, you accept hierarchy in society. And this is why a lot of those, the, the, those, those quote, I'm not sure, I'll politely call them opinions, were often published by the political authority of the time. When you look at the scholars in our own tradition that were supported by the people, by the way that the, 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 all of our fiqh, so the four, four imams, the four madhahab, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, like when you look at all, and they were all interconnected with each other, they usually had issues with the political authority of the time. Because they understood their role in scholarship is speaking truth to power, is checking power, and historically scholarship was the balance that protected, it was the default senate of like, no, we're going to check your power in case you ever think you get to oppress the people here. And when you look at those scholars, far more balanced because their role was to maintain society. The foundation of every Muslim society is the family. I also want to say that these extremes that we see in Western society is just unfortunately an inherent part of Western society. A lot of Islam talks over and over about balance. We, in, in Western societies, you have communism or capitalism or individualism and you don't have anything in between. Islam is like, okay, in a family unit, you are able to be your own self, but you also work within a group. How do I build these balances within our institutions? How do you heal society from the inside out? Again, us showing up as educated, empowered Muslim women. This isn't just for us. This is to bring justice to everyone that is around us. It is to challenge the entire system that said your value is based on white supremacy. It is not a coincidence when you are going to depict, well, I have to I know that Isa didn't have blonde hair and white eye, blue eyes. He didn't. 
But we're going to depict divinity as a white man. That's not a coincidence. And it's an abuse of, a tr of Christianity. I, I work with a lot of Christian reverends. By the way, I'm part of an all-women's team. I think we're the only one in the country. The rabbi's a woman, the reverends are women. Like, it's, it's incredible. SubhanAllah, and when you talk to them, we're like, Isa alayhi salam didn't look like that. That's not what he looked like. But also, how are you now taking my faith and turning and contorting it into something that it's not? We have to have enough haya in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not tell him, be able to tell him, we stood back, watched that happen, and said nothing. When we talk about haya, let's talk about haya in front of Allah. Haya is not you sitting in a corner being quiet. All of the women that we learned about, they all had like buckets of haya, <laughs> endless amounts of haya. They didn't sit in a corner and be quiet when someone else was oppressed because they had enough haya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not just take that and not sit back and be quiet. SubhanAllah. How much time do I have? Okay, awesome. I want to talk about Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam. So Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam, when, it, when you read her story, we talked a little bit about how her mom, she's like, Ya Allah, it's a girl. Because she's from Ali Imran, she was able to live within Bayt al-Maqdis, within the, the, like this, one of the harams, the, one of the holiest places on earth. She got to live there and she was the only woman, woman that was allowed to live there. And all she did all day was like pray and feed the poor. Like she was just in a constant state of ibadah and the angels came to her. And the angels came to her and said, Ya Maryam, oh Maryam, called her out by name. SubhanAllah, so beautiful. You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Maryam alayhi salam by name? And calls Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam by name. It is to elevate them. And the angels call her by name. Ya Maryam, inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nasa al alameen. Oh Maryam, Allah has chosen you, has purified you, has chosen you over all of the women. Ya Maryam, qnuti li rabbiki wa sjudi wa raka'i ma'a raka'in. Oh Maryam, be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make sujood. And make rukur with those who are making rukur. Subhanallah. This is Maryam alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives her a very, very difficult and challenging test. And Jibreel alayhi salam comes and he tells her this and he's like, you're going to have a child. And she's like, wait, what? And in that moment, as she's about, she's going into labor. And she says something that's so profound. She's saying, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasiyam man sayya. She said, if only I had died before today and was long forgotten. And I feel like I've read the men who wrote tafasir and they're like, oh, it's because she feared the pain of, feared the pain of labor. I'm like, women have had babies and they had more babies. Like, no, that's not what this is. Like, clearly you have no idea. For someone to say this, there's something inherent and core to who they are that's being threatened. She knew what her people were going to put her through. And mind you, a religious community and what they were going to put her through. As soon as Isa salam is born, he looks up at his mother and he starts to give her, in the, in the Qur'at it says, فَنَادَهَا مِن تَحْتِهَا or مَن تَحْتَهَا And the one that was below her, or, the, or from below her, she was called and said, shake the tree. قَرِّعَيْنَا Like, be content. And when you meet someone, tell them that you won't speak for three days. When she comes back carrying Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam through the city, she's coming back like, mind you, if, I don't know, the woman who basically lives at the masjid and feeds the poor is holding a baby, maybe she's babysitting. <laughs> maybe she found an orphan child. They didn't say any of that. They looked at her because they'd been gearing up to this. They immediately started slut-shaming her. And they told her, your mother was this and your father was this. How dare you shame your family? Sound familiar? How dare you do this? Also, I don't know how long it takes to go like this. Even as she's doing this, they're like, how can we speak to a child? I, like, subhanAllah, the amount of just, she knew this was coming. And as soon as she pointed to him, alayhi salam, he says, قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ I am the servant of Allah. أَتَانِيَ الْكِتَابَ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَ He gave me the book, he made me a prophet. He also says, وَبَرًّا بِوَلِدَتِي And I am righteous and good to my mother. What I expect of men in our community 
is to follow in the footsteps of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam and to be allies to women in this fight. This isn't about like men versus women. This is about justice versus injustice. Are we here for Allah or are we here for power? And everyone gets to decide this. We already talked about how there are certain women that unfortunately uphold some of these like horrible systems like, oh, be, be, know your place. I actually got an email like that once, which I was like, in my mind, and I'm like, if you were a caricature of a misogynist, you wouldn't have hit it this hard. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam said, I have my mother's back. And this is what we should expect, and this is what we should demand of our men. SubhanAllah. When I first interviewed for the job, Dr. Rani was on the call. I'm like, whatever this job is, I'm taking it. <laughs> And the first conversation I had, I'm like, oh, I had some really difficult conversations with certain people. And she's like, I'm willing to bet they're the same people. And I'm like, I love you so much. <laughs> it's our responsibility to hold them accountable. And I feel like the more spaces I've been in, like I, there was, uh, I, won't, I can't even remember his name and I don't care to mention his name. He came and he was speaking and I was working for the Muslim Youth of North America. And he came in, the way he was interacting with the teenage girls didn't, like, it just, it sat with me and I was like, I don't like this. I don't like what, like, I don't like how you're interacting with them. And I went, because I was the one in charge of the list of speakers, and I just took, I just deleted him off like a Google sheet and I was like, he is not coming back. SubhanAllah, 10 years later, I realized he was one of these abusers that the, the women took down. And I looked at that and I was like, SubhanAllah, what if I hadn't trusted my intuition? What if I had sat there and said, oh, but what do I know? And blah, 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 blah. No, the way he was interacting with teenage girls was inappropriate. It is my job to protect them. You have no right to be in this space. If you don't know that you shouldn't be hanging out with teenage girls after hours at a campsite, you should never be allowed to come back. And alhamdulillah, he was never allowed to come back. And there were enough incidents like that that I'm like, yeah, Allah, this is so hard. But I want to stand on the footsteps, through the footsteps of Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam. I want to meet her in Jannah and deserve to have a conversation with her. I want to meet Sayyidina Khawla radiallahu anha in Jannah. I want to live my life according to those things so I can deserve to be there. So they don't look back at us and say, we fought long and hard. And what did you do? Sit back and do nothing? And I want to say this of like, sometimes the fights isn't like, oh, I'm going to sit here and yell it. Like, no, I've never, alhamdulillah, I don't. No, I've gotten angry. I'm not going to pretend I haven't. But I remember I walked in, and this was the masjid that I was on the board of. Like, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, if you're saying this to me, I can't imagine what you're saying to other women. But one of the, the self-appointed people that have, the self-appointed angry uncle in the masjid, and I feel like every masjid has one. By the way, all the churches have them, all the synagogues have, like, I was very, like, I was so relieved to find out we weren't the only ones that have this person. But the designated angry uncle at the masjid, he comes to me, he's like, let's be clear, I don't want to see you here again. I pointed to the spot, and like, here, uncle, Allahu Akbar. I prayed Maghrib and Aisha in that spot for two weeks straight. He come in, you, I point to the spot, Allahu Akbar. I didn't raise my voice. <laughs> I didn't raise my voice. I didn't argue with, it. like, I knew it wasn't going to work. But I was not going to give up that space. I'm not going to give up the space that Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam created for us. I was never going to give up that spot. <laughs> Afterwards, he would see me, he'd turn around. <laughs> I, Alhamdulillah. I don't... SubhanAllah. I just, I think it's really important for us to know our own tradition and to not accept what junk people have told us. I was preparing a talk, we have an interfaith group, and I was preparing a talk, and I was like, oh, it would be really great if I talked about Rabi al Adawi alayhi rahmatullah. And everything that I looked up in English was, there is no way women in an Arabian society had power like this. But Rabia had everyone and all the leaders like listening to her. And I'm like, aren't you disproving the point you're actually making? It's so, like, how are you saying in one sentence, all, like, Sayyid bin Musayyib radiallahu anhu, like, I yeah, radiallahu anhu, I guess, he's one of the tabi'in. She decided in one of the sessions that he was sitting with her that he talked too much about the dunya and banned him from coming back. He's one of the greatest scholars of her time. 
And she's like, I don't like this guy. He doesn't come back. He doesn't have a right to my time. All of them, they went and asked her for advice. This is not new. We have always been doing this, and we hand it off one generation after another, whether we know their names or not. The story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam actually begins with his mother. Talks about his sister. We don't know their names and we don't need to know their names because mothers do this. Sisters do this. The men needed to be stated by name because what they were doing was exceptional among the men. Honestly. Alhamdulillah, we have so much dignity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah allow all of us to, to, to live out what Allah has written for us. May, may we meet the Prophet and all of these women that we talked about, may they be proud of us. May we live our lives in a way that makes them proud of us. Prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad. Allahu Akbar Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Thank you so much, Dr. Amina. SubhanAllah. May Allah bless you and increase you. Okay. Thank you. MashaAllah. Now you know why we wanted to bring her to California, right? MashaAllah. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah, this shall never happen to you in this masjid, Ya Rab, or in any other masjid that you enter. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really allow us, um, inshallah, to Im really learn and understand our deen as we talked about earlier and to embody that and to do it with grace and to do it with sincerity, the kind of humility where, where the, the shaking angry fist and you can and should be angry at times isn't always necessarily the answer as Dr. <laughs> Amin's example showed us, mashallah. Babalawa Kunali is a licensed mental health therapist, an LMFT, a licensed marriage family therapist, with over 30 years of professional experience working with culturally diverse youth, children, and families in community mental health and school-based settings. Her work and research has a special focus on prevention and intervention, with the goal of improving academic outcomes and the social determinants of health. She's extensively studied the neurobiology of trauma and the effects of racism and poverty on communities, families, individuals, and complex systems. Bobalwa's areas of specializations are complex multi-generational trauma, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, trauma-informed school-based mental health, impact of secondary trauma on educators and learning, complex family systems, cultural humility, and culturally responsive care. Mashallah. And I'm really excited to tell you that she's one of our supervisors at Madistan. Alhamdulillah. The organization that's at the corner. Keep checking it out. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Today's conversation is called Better Invisible, question mark, right? And this is, um, the topic is basically about African-American women in the community despite facing prejudice, discrimination, and racism from both within and outside the Muslim community are often made to feel invisible, as though their contributions are not much or as meaningful to the larger Muslim community as they actually are. We felt this was so important to have a conversation around this, and we're so happy that you're with us, Sister Babalwa, today. Thank you so much for joining us. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Barameen. Rahman Rahim. Medikiyomidin. And I send blessings to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before I begin. Alhamdulillah. So this is a um, a difficult topic for some, and an easier topic to talk about for others. And I think it's a topic that is important, and I'm really grateful that that the question is here uh, for me to talk about today. As a related, I'm an African American woman. Um, and um, a convert to Islam about 25 years ago. And so the question, you know, is looking at um, African-American women and, um, and facing prejudice and discrimination within and outside of our Islamic community. So there's a few points that I did want to talk about to begin with, and one which is the, the concept of colorblindness. And we talk about that. We talk about that within, even within our own ummah. And colorblindness, I just see you as my Muslim sister, and, but not necessarily seeing me and my color and where I'm from, nor my lived experiences. One of the things that we have experienced in this country is really looking at what happened in 2019 and 2020. 
I think that really began to blossom and show the world where some of the things that people of African-American descent and other people from marginalized communities in our country, what we're going through and have been going through, that experience of day-to-day -day racism that I've experienced myself. Now, there's times that when I experience this situation, I go to my, think to myself, now which box is it? Is it the box of being a woman? Is it the box of being a Muslim? Is it the box of being African American? Is it the box of being, which one is it that I'm discriminated for? Right? And my place of work, my place in the community, walking through the store, and sometimes even in my masjid. And so that's something for us to begin to talk about. So let me first explain this idea of colorblindness as a sister, and then I'm going to end with where we exist within the, our holy book, the Quran, and in the life of Prophet Muhammad Islam. Huge presence of African and African women that are there in our Islamic movement that help to change so much and bring so much alive, yet is not highlighted. So colorblindness is really defined as refusing to acknowledge the social and legal or historical, historical role that, play, that, that, that plays in, the, in, in our society that relates to race, racial experiences. It's sort of pretending like it doesn't happen. They were all seen just the same. I've had folks say to me in, in my place of job to say, why do you refuse to be so different? Why do you wear that? And why don't you just, why can't you be just like me? I said, well, you're a white woman and I'm not. <laughs> I am being me. Why would I want to be like you? I enjoy and love who I am as a dark-skinned African-American woman. Alhamdulillah, Allah made me the way that I am. Alhamdulillah, And that doesn't mean that I have to look like her to be normalized. So in that particular situation, I'd love to share stories. In that particular situation, when I moved into that particular office, I was a supervisor. So it was really hard to have, to, to have someone that is the same level or a little higher than, than they were professionally and be black. In that institution, that had never happened before. So it was already upsetting the quote unquote status quo. I wasn't meant to be seen as a peer. I was meant to be seen as someone who cleans up, not as someone who can make administrative decisions. And the question was, when I decorated my office, I had my Islamic gear and I had my, my, um, my uh, beautiful African uh, garb up on the walls, and, it's, and they thought, oh my god, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> why? And that's when the question became, why do, you, why do you dress like that? Because I can. And why are you so different? I reflect the students that are coming into the center. So then I became worried, like if they're treating me this way, then how are they treating our children? How are we treating the young girls who are coming into this health space that need help that are girls of color without seeing them for who they are? Without seeing these Muslim women, these girls, and these, and these you know, and non-Muslims for who they are. So when we take a look at it. If one does not see my color and doesn't see where I'm from and my historical legacy, then they don't see me. I am invisible. I'm invisible wherever I go. Either it's two pieces. Either I'm invisible or I'm hyper-visible. Remember when I asked you about the boxes and things like that? So one day I walk into my office and there's a flyer with pigs on it. And they're having a, a get together for all staff, a luncheon. And it had the flying pigs. And at the bottom it said, vegetarians aren't welcome. So that was clear. And I was supposed to take it and think, oh, it's just funny joke. No, it's not. We're going to EEOC and file a formal complaint and make sure that my voice is heard because I know that I represent other women that look like me. Remember being the trailblazer, being the first one and the only one. So many times in my professional career have I been the only one in the room. And I know the weight that that carries for me as a sister. And as a Muslima, it means the next time that somebody looks like you, 
that comes in, it becomes my charge to help to pave the way, to tell you, no, no, you can take the fire with the pigs on it and talk to the attorney tomorrow. And that is just what happened, because attorneys did have to talk to them about the flying pigs. And believe it or not, that was the only evidence that I had to prove of racism. It wasn't what was said. It wasn't what was done. It wasn't how it was treated. And it wasn't all these questions about, um, why do you want to be this way? Why, why do you, these constant what's called microaggressions, and that's another term for us to understand. What are microaggressions? Microaggressions are slights that happen, cuts that happen to our being and to our soul and ourselves that almost leaves us a question like, was that just a race? Something racist just happened? I'm not sure. It felt really uncomfortable. That's a microaggression. Or micro assault by leaving a pig flyer on my desk. I could have chose to do nothing, but I knew that what that meant for me and the status of what I was, of being the only one again, an African-American hijabi. So many other pieces was important. One, being a Muslim sister, the only Muslim sister that was ever in that center, ever. That meant a lot. So that my sisters coming behind me wouldn't have to deal with it as much. But you still do. Let's not be confused about it because it doesn't mean it's going to go away. So when we take a look at that, that lived reality and going back to this question of colorblindness within our Uma and our community, it's very important for us as sisters to really understand our own history and the space and the place that we live in. And understand that the, that the fight of anti-blackness and looking at that becomes incumbent upon us, each and every Muslim that's in this room. Because I am your sister. And if I'm hurting and in pain and being discriminated against, so are you. Even if you are my white sister, I am your sister. We stand side by side for justice. That's our right. And it's very important that we carry that role out. The other piece that's important is for us to begin to look into inside of ourselves and something that's race neutral. That's another term, is race neutral. And what that means is this concept of let's just neutralize race. Let's not talk about it. Okay, it's there. I'll acknowledge that it's there. But we won't really go into it as much. We'll talk about the parts of us that are alike. And that's how we'll communicate with each other, is the parts that are alike. And it's almost like trying to neutralize racism, trying to neutralize its existence by focusing on something else, the fact that we both have in common that we're Muslims. But when we do that, when we neutralize the racism and neutralize the peace that begins to exist within our very community, you're also neutralizing me. It's disregarding my lived experience and the lived experience of sisters that look like me. You pray next to me. You pray for me. I pray for you. And we want that justice to be there for each other. How can we begin to avoid some of these pieces that are happening, and even in our own families? We know that there's family members from different cultures that have a term that they use for African American people and Muslims. I won't use it here. But we know what that term is when calling someone a slave, right? And sometimes it's common vernacular in certain communities in our Muslim communities. We know that. And now that you know, you know better. And then it becomes your responsibility as sisters, as my sister, to communicate within your families to say, that's not right. That's a Muslim. That's a Muslima. Their lived experience is extremely difficult. And it becomes our responsibility to correct the wrongs that exist even within our own families and even within ourselves. How do we do that? Educating ourselves. Learning more about the very sister that you pray next to. 
understanding more about our lived reality, our lived experiences, to visibilize us, and that's another term. Visibilization, to visibilize me as I visibilize you. We're in a society where it's white male dominant society, where right, white supremacy rules. That's just what it is, male patriarchal society. And so I'm far on the end, end of that. I remember when I was even taking my licensing exam, and, and I had to give myself a brain shift, because in the exam, there was a question that said, uh, vignette, they're vignettes for my license exam for mental health. And the vignette said, Tyrone and his girlfriend, who are black, were drug addicts. What would you do to help to create a family system care for this, I need you to answer the vignette. Of course I'm triggered, because everybody else was relatively healthy with some minor problems until we got to Tyrone, which is a historically African-American male name on the California licensing exam for my license. So we look at it, even some of the smaller places of where racism exists can begin to attack the soul. I had to tell myself during a timed exam, Babalawa, you know where you are. You know yourself, pull yourself together. You know that this is one of the ticklers that's in the exam to make you fail. Move past it. Your people need you. And I prayed. I stopped and prayed. The time is still going on that exam. And I prayed, oh, Allah, help me through this. Because I didn't expect to read that on a professional licensing exam. So when we look at visibilization and hyper being hyper-visualized, visibilized, so what is it to be hyper-visualized? That means I'm seen very broadly for the wrong reasons, right? Either you don't see me or you see me really loudly. I'll give you another example. I went to a training on trauma because that's one of my areas of specialization. No one else there were people of color. I was the only one in the room again, right? And of mostly white women in the room. And I want to ask the trainer a question. So I deliberately wore very bright clothing, which I do, folks who know me, the Babala was like sunshine. He has bright colors all over the place. <laughs> and I sat in the front of the room, as I do with many trainings, because I'm thinking you're going to see me. Five other people were called before I was. And I could hear the audience behind me going, oh my God, oh my God, he's not calling it that black lady. He's not calling on the only black lady in the room. I'm like, how can you miss me? Pretty obvious. <laughs> How did that happen? But I knew what was happening. And I said, write it out. Just write it out. And then, and then the whole audience began, became aware of the racism that was existing there as a, as a Muslim woman. So the last piece that I want to talk about really is our spiritual asset mapping. And that's another term. So asset mapping, and I'd be happy to go over these terms with you in Q&A if you have further questions about them. When we look at what is spiritual asset mapping, that doesn't, what is that? So it's sort of like some things that you can think about that's in your life, in your circle of support, the people, the tools, the supports that are there, and you're measuring them out and seeing what's there. But if you don't know me, or know sisters that look like me, and our lived experiences, how can you know how that can be a benefit to you and how can you be a benefit to her? So you're looking at all of the assets that you have that are in your life that are human people that can be supportive in your spiritual life, that can help you, and that you can help me. So that's the piece that is, that is really, really important. And then the last part, I promise, am I running out of time? I'm good, okay. Is, um, is this piece around... Um, systemic racism and anti-blackness. And so I talked a little bit about that and like, what does that have to do with Islam? What does systemic racism have to do with Islam? Our Prophet Muhammad Salam, did a whole speech on this, right? There's a whole talk about this and about the color question. And here we are, how many centuries later, still struggling with this very simple concept and understanding. It means that we have not mastered it yet. 
And it means that if we don't have the conversations and some uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations, we just won't move beyond this point. It's imperative. And for some of you, it may have even been the first time that you've heard the conversation in a masjid about, this, about systemic racism, about marginalization, and about the invisibility of black women and Muslim black women. If this is your first time, promise yourself before you leave here today that this will not be the last time, that you will take that mantle up yourself and bring it forward. We're depending on you, and our lives are depending on it. There's a reason why people of color, particularly the African-American people in this country, are at the top of the deaths of COVID, the tops of deaths in, in by other health disease, and other health, um, what's called autoimmune, autoimmune disorders, is higher among women of color, particularly African-American women. First of all, higher among women, period. That's something to be said and then women of color and African-American women and Muslim women. Why we suffer the most from autoimmune, autoimmune dis disorders and diseases? Because we think about that daily stress, those microaggressions we talked about, the microassaults, I didn't mention microassaults, but microassaults, all of these lived experiences of being in black skin in the country, in the place we're in, takes a toll on the mind and the body and the soul, physically on the body. And what happens with um, autoimmune disorders is that the body begins to turn on itself and thinks that it's, it's attacking itself because it's trying to fight something within itself, physically. Right? And as a layman, the doctor can give a better definition than I can. That's my layman's decision, my layman's description. And, and so why is that important? Of your taking up the mantle of this charge as well is to help to save your sister's life. That sounds like, oh, come on, Mavalo, it's pretty grand to say, no, it's not. And, and don't quote me on the statistics, but almost out of perhaps maybe five women, African-American women, three of them or three and a half of them have some sort of an autoimmune disorder or some sort of a health disorder or, some, or struggling with the mental health concern. Now does the problem change? It looks different. Now am I visible? And the question asking, better invisible? Is it really? Is it really better to be invisible? No. It becomes our responsibility. And as sisters that love me and I love you and we all love Islam, it's our responsibility as well to make sure that we're changing the tide of what is happening right now in our communities through education and knowledge and understanding and love. We're doing it from the standpoint of love and joy. So, I don't know what my time is. Did I go over? I'm still good? I'm good? Okay. And so, I'm gonna keep you. <laughs> so, there's a piece that I can kind of get into a little bit around um, some uh, cultural differences. And how much time is it going? Okay. And so looking at some of the cultural differences and within our Islamic communities, and there's this piece that I talked about here in terms of like a caste-like system. And so, and, that, and what that means is, is that in the system that we live in is that darker people are seen at the bottom and um, lighter skinned people are seen at the top or more visualized. And also seen as more important as the scholars. So I think it's really, really important, or I know it's really, really important for us to understand the Islamic scholars, the Muslim scholars, that are African women who have profound knowledge of this deen, profound knowledge of history, and that also exist in the time of Prophet Muhammad Islam. Who's Badaka? Someone tell me who Badaka is other than my daughter because of her name. Who, who is Badaka? Yes, ma'am. What did Badaka look like? Just ask. Him. Say again? Uh -huh. What does that look like? Like who? Huh? Yeah. And we think about who the other, thank you so much, sisters. And so we think about who's Hajjah? 
And peace and blessings be upon them both. Right? And so you think about who Hajj is, who these women are, that are throughout our Islamic history that are black women, that are holders of, of knowledge, of sacred knowledge. And when we go to, but when we're running from Safra Mara, what are we doing? Right? And so we think about some of these other, other pieces that exist, and then, then it creates this thing. There's another term I'm giving up, like I'm in teaching a class cognitive dissonance. Okay, there's a word with cognitive dissonance. It creates this sense of cognitive dissonance. Did you all talk about that today? Did I miss that one? Mm -hmm. So cognitive dissonance is something that's sort of like this torn asunder feeling, this feeling inside like, well, how can both of these two opposite things be, be true? Something is not quite right. Something's off kilter here. Something is, is amiss here. So it creates that stressor of cognitive dissonance within us. Well, I'm told that these people who are darker skinned are less than, but in reality, these folks have a tremendous amount of information and knowledge, and these sisters are holders of so much um, sacredness within our community, right? And then it creates that sense of cognitive. How is, cognitive, how is cognitive dissonance resolved? Because you can go back and forth in the soul for a long time, is that information is that learning and that coming to peace with ourselves if we are the holders of folks that are lighter skinned that are benefits from, from being lighter skinned, right? And we look at that oppression. So when we look at oppression, we look at these things too. Those are really important and it helps to visibilize your sister. So I'll end with that piece around really looking at that visibilization of your sister, really looking at um, spiritual asset mapping, and some homework assignments that folks have. I'm giving you homework today, okay? So, <laughs> and doing some of the homework pieces is really looking at those words, digging into those terms of microaggressions, microassault, the cognitive dissidents, spiritual conflicts. Content neutrality, race neutrality, and spiritual asset mapping. And so these are some things when you're really thinking about and have through your lens is your African American, your black sister, who's from all continents around, different places, we're from all over, that, that look like us, that look like me, and really working that through. The last phase is looking at the terms racism, systemic racism and marginalization. And look at how that, how was that impacted and who benefits from it? Who benefits from systemic racism? And who is victimized by it? And what are our roles and responsibilities as Muslimas? Because you do love your sister, because I know that you love this deen. Alhamdulillah, and know that our very lives do depend on that love. That love that I have for you and the love that you have for each other and the love that you have for me. And the love mostly that we have for the steen and for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the families. Alhamdulillah, but I Thank you so much. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Thank you so much, Samo. Amazing. Alhamdulillah. We have, inshallah, with us Dr. Haifa Yunus. I'm so, so honored that she's with us today, alhamdulillah. Many of you know her, she's no stranger to you, alhamdulillah. But even so, we're going to read the bio because as we said at every one of our speakers, it is so beautiful to understand the many different accomplishments and parts of our different ustadas' lives so that we're fully inspired, right? Each and every one brings such a beautiful, beautiful um, background with her. Dr. Haifa Yunus is an American board certified obstetrician and gynecologist with roots from Iraq. Her pursuit of Islamic knowledge initiated when she began studying the various Islamic, with his various Islamic scholars from around the United States, and simultaneously attended individual courses and lectures on topics including aqidah, fiqh, usul al-fiqh, hadith, taskiyah. From the United States, she moved to Saudi Arabia, where she graduated from the Mecca Institute of Islamic Studies in Jeddah, and Al-Huda Quran Memorization School also in Jeddah where she completed memorization of the Qur'an. 
Alhamdulillah. She is the founder and the chairman of Jannah Institute and currently holds and teaches seminars on thematic commentary of the various chapters of the Holy Quran, their practical relevance in our day-to-day -day life. Additionally, she offers retreats on key topics and inspires hearts, combining the inner essence of Islam with the outward expression and practice. Dr. Haifa is passionate about spreading the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and igniting the love of Islam and the Quran through her teachings. May Allah bless her. Ameen. My dear sisters, if you don't know yet about the Jannah Institute, who I consider to be our sister institute at the Rahma Foundation, please, please take a look at the Jannah Institute's offering. It's your long course. It's many different halakas and classes. You must be aware of this organization that's for women, run by women as well, alhamdulillah. Very, very excited to have Dr. Haifa here with us. And so, <laughs> the topic for today is called Best? Question mark. And here is what the topic says, is the description. It says, women are the creation of God, servants endowed with intellect and capacity to know him intimately through the pursuit of sacred knowledge and worship. They're multifaceted, unique in disposition, temperament, interests, and talents. They are inwardly and outwardly beautiful when their virtues and characteristics reflect their love and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we wrap up today's conversation and the entire conference we've had today, think about all the different parts of the discussion and all the different speakers who came before and how this topic, mashallah, is going to wrap it all up together, alhamdulillah, and really push, we've been pushing on assumptions We've been revisiting ayat and ahadith and other statements that we've heard about women over time that have really, as I'm reading some of your questions, that have really impacted our health, our spiritual, our physical, emotional, our mental health as women, subhanAllah. And much of it, to use the word I kept using earlier today, is nonsense, right? And much of it is actually in our own minds. And so as we kind of reorient ourselves to what Islam actually teaches, there's no one better to talk about this than Dr. Haifa Yunus to wrap us up, inshallah. Barakallah fiqi, thank you for joining us. Assalamu alaikum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me better than what everything you heard, and may he forgive everything you don't know about me, ya Rabbi, ameen. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك سميع مجيب الدعاء اللهم أني أعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ونفس لا تشبع ودعاء لا يسمع ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا رب أمين جزاكم الله خير for coming before I start I want everyone to take a minute literally a minute it will feel very long but it's only 60 seconds you just stop doing everything turn off your phones and just think in this 60 seconds about everything you heard this mo from this morning till now. What impacted you? What didn't? What resonate? What didn't? And then we'll talk. How about that? 60 seconds. Bismillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ya ayuhal nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakari wa untha, wa jaalnaakum shu'uban wa qabaila li ta'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. I have no doubt that every woman in this room, 
and probably everybody listening to us know this verse. If there is any verse you hear, it's one, this one of the most common one. O oh, people, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying this, it's in Surah Al-Hujurat at the end, and he's addressing humanity. It's not Muslim. It's not, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. It is not, Ya ayyuhal mu'minun. Ya ayyuhal nas, you and me. Inna Allah, we, khalaqnakum, created you. ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْتَ Male and a female. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلٍ And we have made you nations and tribes. Look around you. Look to your right and look to your left and how different we are. And if you still don't know we are different, then you didn't listen to the most beautiful talk I just heard. We need to listen a lot to these, to live reality. And why did Allah do that? Every time I read this verse, I was like, didn't Allah, well, is Allah not able of creating all of us the same? Same color, same shape, same length, same height, same eye color? Why? Two reasons. It's in the verse itself. One is obvious and one is hidden. The obvious, to know each other. First thing you all have to ask, and then I'll come to the best, because that's part of the best. How many people you know as a friend that does not fit your own description? That does not speak the same language, that does not eat the same food, that does not look like you, that does not share the same background? It's very little. Am I right? Wow, you have a non-Muslim friend? You have a white friend? I'm an Arab. <gasps> you have a non-Arab friend? This is why he created you and me in different ways. And he is able of creating us any way he wants. Subhana. Then the hidden, which comes to the best. The best among you, you all know, it's, this is how you translate it actually, or the most honorable one, it depends how you want to translate. Atqaqum. The most honorable, the best among you, not women or men, nothing to do with gender. Taqwa. Why am I wasting my time about I am a woman or I am a man? Did you get my point? It's not going to make any difference in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zero. If I am in front of him, Subhana, he's not going to look at me, I am Haifa, or I am Muhammad. He's going to look at me as what? His creation, his servant. Regardless, he or she. So why am I wasting my time in you? This is the trap you all have to get out of. You probably did not expect me to say this. But we need to get out of this trap. Don't fall into the gender. Look at the bigger picture. Right? وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ What did he say? إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ Khalifa. Did he define who's the Khalifa? Did he say a man? Did he say a woman? Did he say an Arab? Did he say a non-Arab? Why do we fall in this trap? Why? It's me. It's you. This is the first thing you all have to start rethinking. Change the way you think and look individually. Individually, are you falling into this trap? The answer is, I want to hear it. Yes. 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 Whether I am in the trap of being the victim or I am in the trap of being the one who's going to carry the justice against the victim. Both of them. I am missing the point. Because what it should be my point? I want all of you to think with me. Why I am in this world? The question was raised in more than one speaker. Why I'm here? To have fun? To prove I am the best? 
to prove we are equal? Is that why he created me? I need to hear the answer. Why did he create me? And what does worship mean? To know him. To know him. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And you go and read the commentary. العبادة هنا is not worship. Because if you translate worship, you absolutely have narrowed this verse. Oh, I need to pray. Oh, I need to fast. Oh, I need to wear my hijab. You missed it. 80% of this verse, you missed it. Know Allah. I had this discussion recently with someone. A lot of people have dreams, which the dreams are beautiful. And they said, we need to bring Medina back in our masajid. It's a beautiful dream. And they looked at me and they, they, they sensed I am, I have something different. And I'm going to ask you the question I asked. When did Medina start? After how many years? Roughly, roughly. Right? Why didn't Medina start first? Isn't Allah capable? And what was the difference between Medina and Mecca? Not the cities, the Muslim Ummah. As you heard, Al-Ansar, the helper, the lover, everybody loves each other. We don't need Medina, this is what I said. We don't need Medina. What do we need? Why? Because we don't have him inside us. This is what Rasul did in all his time in Mecca. Even Salah didn't come first. It's Ya Ayyuhan Nas, Abudullah, Abudu Rabbakum. Worship your Lord. Know who is your Lord. And this is our problem. And I'm not going to say it's a woman problem. I'm going to be very honest. It's a humanity problem. We don't know who's Allah, right? If I ask you who's Allah, you're going to tell me he's the one who created me. But does you really believe he's the one who created you? Do you really believe in this? And I say, okay, give me another thing. And you're going to give me all the 99 names, if even more. And you say, he's a Razzaq. And I said, really? She looked at me, I was like, what did, she, what did I say? I said, is he really a Razzaq? Is he really a Razzaq? I want to hear the answer. Really? Then why do you call somebody else when you need something? It's sad. It's painful. You just said he's a Razzaq. Why do you call someone else? You just said he's a Qawi. You give me any of the names you know. And then immediately he tests me and he tests you. Immediately. And I, without me knowing, showing him, and he knows, but to show me how hypocrite I am in my tongue. He's a shafi. He's the one who cure. And when I get sick, what do I do? Do I call him first? Do I turn to him, Ya Rabbi, please cure me? Ya Allah, make this tablet that I'm putting in my mouth works? No. Who is the best physician? And you start texting and on the groups. This is what we are missing. We women, and again, I'm speaking because I'm speaking to women. What we are missing these days to be the best. And I'm going to give you some examples of the best. Some of them you don't even know the name, and I don't know the name. The best is the woman who her focus in life is not her children is not her husband, is not her career, is not her beauty, it's not her house. It's only one answer. Al-Wahid. The one. The one. How many of you, and don't show me hands, this is between you and Allah, and He knows. How many of you can say it confidently, as if she is in front of Allah, and says, Ya Rabbi, I lived for you. I did everything for you. I got married for you.
for you. I had children for you. I studied, worked hard to make my career for you. I wanted to be educated for you. Memorize the Quran for you. Islamic studies started Islamic institutions, you name it, for you. How many can claim this now and in front of Allah will say it? The answer is, if I want to be very honest with everybody, if I say this, am I right? Am I honest with myself? That's what's missing, ladies, my beautiful sisters, young and old. Don't blame the young. I stopped a long time ago blaming the young. You know why? Because what they are seeing in me, what are they seeing? And I'm not defending them, but it's again reality. So here you are, you are in Pleasanton, let's say in St. Louis, let's say in Southern California, and you are this pious woman, real pious woman, everybody knows, mashallah. And then they accused you of the most painful, degrading, accusation a woman can have. And what is that as a Muslim woman? Exactly. Oh, she has an affair. What will happen to you? Answer me. What will happen to you? Everybody is talking. It's the talk of the town. Everyone. But no one to say this to you. But you can see it, you can feel it. You know, you, they, you come in and they stop talking. And then your husband come to you. And they say, to, he says to you in your face, in front of your fa father and mother, tell me, if you did it, ask Allah to forgive you. Feel what I'm saying. And if you didn't do it, say it. What will you answer? I want to hear it. What will you say? Honestly. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. If you know this in the Arabic language, when you say Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil, meaning you have given up, and I'm not going to even answer, and may Allah punish you. Because Sayyidina Ibrahim said that when he was thrown in the fire. What else you will do? Anxiety, panic attack, you're gonna cry. Am I right? Angry, how dare? What do you think of me? Look at yourself, and on and on and on and on. Right? How many will turn and says, you allowed it to happen, Ya Allah. What are you teaching me? What do you want me to say? What should I do? Whose story was this? What did she answer? That's what I need to hear. You all knew the answer, alhamdulillah. That's the best. To me, this is the best. In all the stories of Sayyidina Aisha, everything you know about Sayyidina Aisha, this is story, tell me, what a strong woman should be, what a woman of Allah should be, and one, what a woman of opinion should be. What did she say? And who said that to her was a Rasul alayhi salatu I will be dead. Every time I read this, I, I just can't imagine. I'm a woman, you are a woman. You know how painful is this? Let alone you're innocent, let alone it's coming from your husband, let alone your husband is the best of the creation. Alayhi salatu What did she say? You need to memorize that statement. You want to be strong? You want to be, you have your opinion? You want to be a woman of Allah? You want to be the best? What did she say? The meaning. لا 
فقد وقع في قلوبكم. She said this to her father, mother, and husband. الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام. سيدنا أبو بكر أم رومان. She said it's already in your heart. And if I said I am innocent, and Allah knows I am innocent, see what came out of the mouth. You will not believe me. And if I say I did it, and I didn't do it, you will believe me. And I'm not going to say a word other than what the father of Ya'qub, she couldn't even, father of Ya'qub, that's exact, she couldn't even remember his name, said. And she turned her back to Rasul and to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, her father, and to Umm Roman, and said, فصبر جميل والله المستعان على ما تصفون What a woman is this? Beautiful patient and Allah will help me about what you are saying about me. And she turned her back. This is she. Go and read this in the Quran in every commentary of Hadith Al-Ifq, Ayat Al-Ifq you will hear this story. It's, it's narrated by her. And then she said, Wallahi, I never thought, look at this. I never thought I am, she, worthy in the sight of Allah that he will send the Quran to be recited till the end of the time to tell me I am innocent. And then, Immediately, that page of Surah An-Nur, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّى كِبَرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And she said, I could see the Messenger of Allah, Quran is being revealed. Because he changed. And you know what happens to him when Quran was revealed. And then he starts smiling. And he looked at her and he said, Nazar, the meaning of your innocence came from, the, from Allah, from the heavens. Everybody is happy, right? Wait. The impact is not done yet. The best is to the last. So her father, and her mother, Qumi, get up, go to Rasul She said, no, I am only gonna thank the one who sent my innocence. It's Allah. Where are you from that example? A woman, 2022, live in the United States, live in California, educated, you have everything. Where are you from this? What is the difference between me, you, all of us, and Sayyidah Aisha? Don't tell me she's the wife of Rasul She was tested because she was the wife of Rasul What is the difference? I need to hear it, and I want you to think. How can I be like the finger of Sayyidah Aisha? Finger, nail, one hair. How? You know what's missing? It's not because they don't let women go to the masjid. And I have my own opinion about that, and I'm one of the people who says, لا تمنع مساجد الله لا تمنع إيماء الله مساجد الله. Don't prevent the servant of Allah, the she servant of Allah, from the houses of Allah. But that's not the issue. The issue is not the masjid. Believe me. The masjid is not because of lack of education. Believe me. You know what's the issue? It's me. It's my nafs. It's me. Everything is way more. I say this to me. I'm talking to me, not to you. Everything in this life is more important than him. 
I think of everyone else first, and then him. I only think of him when I need him. تعرف إلى الله في الرخاء يعرفك في الشدة. Know Allah at time of adversity, He will know you at time of. No, I'm sorry, learn about Allah and turn to Allah at time of prosperity. He will know you at time of adversity. That's a Sayyidah Aisha. Do you know about her ibadah? About her act of worship? How long a man came? Of course, she was a faqih, she was knowledgeable, you all know that. So a man came to ask her a question, duha time, during the day. And then she found her praying. Duha, two rukat. He was waiting and waiting and waiting because she was still praying. Another man came to him and says, oh, you're waiting for her to finish? Go and do whatever you need to do and come back. She may be finished. How long is your salah? If you pray five times a day, how long is your dua? How long is your reading the Quran? And how long you spend time on the WhatsApp, social media, or in the kitchen? It's painful. It's so painful, young and old. And I'm not speaking to the young. I'm speaking to everybody. The best, the best is that woman who I heard it from a young girl 20 years ago. We were in an Islamic conference. And we were in line asking the sheikh. She looked at him and says, Ya Sheikh, I heard this. I have decided to go to Jannah. Subhanallah, I was like, what? You know, what do we normally decide? I am going to go to medical school. I am going to move. I'm going to buy a house. I am going to have another baby. I am going to, you know, this is how we decide. This is major decisions. And, and I looked and I was like, what made her put this goal? I haven't seen her. I, I actually saw only her back. I don't even know how she looks like. But I can tell she's young. Young, young. Maybe 17, 18, 19. How many of us, your goal, your goal is Jannah? I should have asked you before I said this. Man amila saliha, min dhakarina unta. وهو مؤمن فأولئك يدخلون الجنة يرزقون فيها بغير حساب Whomsoever does a good deed man and a woman why do you worry about it? Why do you worry about it and you waste your energy and think about it? He said it read your Quran ذكر أو أنثى man and a woman but you need to do the first part. Man amila salihan. Wa huwa mu'min. And you're a believer, not a believer. I believe in Allah. And the first test Allah gives you, good or bad, by the way, good or bad, you are praying for your son to get married. You're praying for your daughter to get married. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send exactly your dua you did on the night of Al-Qadr, Allah send it. And the first thing you do, is what? You throw this wedding with every disobedience of him. Every disobedience of him. And you want to be the best. Ala inna sal'at Allahi ghaliyah. Ala inna sal'at Allahi jannah. What Allah has is very expensive. It's very expensive. It's very hard. It's Jannah. That's the best. That's the best. You want to be the best? That's the best. You want to talk about equality? I don't like this word. It annoys me. Honestly. 
Always. I was like, why do you think, why do I need to care about this? He said it. Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat. Wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat. Right? Wal-Khashi'ina wal-Khashi'at. Wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqat. Wal-Sabirina wal-Sabirat. Wal-Mutasaddiqina wal-Mutasaddiqat. Wal-Sa'imina wal-Sa'imat. Wal-Hafidhina furujahum. Wal-Hafidhina furujahum. Wal-Hafidhat. والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات what will happen أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما every description and I'm going to go through it because that's the best this is the best Muslim true Muslim men and women believer men and women surrender to Allah men and women Patient, men and women. Truthful, men and women. Sa'imi, fasting, Ramadan is coming, men and women. Charity, men and women. Guard your private part, and not necessarily only private part. Everything else gets to that direction. Guard it, men and women. Yes, he does need to lower her gaze, but you need to lower your gaze first. I, a long time ago, I get very irritated from blaming others. This is not Islam. It's always me, number one. He's looking at me, you lower your gaze. Don't look at him, says you lower your gaze. You lower your gaze. And show him by action, you're the Muslim woman. وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا They remember Allah a lot. Where is your dhikr? Two minutes after salah, we couldn't sit. Two minutes. And you tell me you want to be the best, and I need to go to the masjid? Well, here you are. Alhamdulillah. The masjid is very welcoming, beautiful, beautiful woman, education, room. Where are you? Don't blame anyone. As a shaitan said, this is one of the powerful verses in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim. The meaning of it, لا تلوموا أنفسكم لا تلوموني ولوموا أنفسكم Don't blame me. Shaitan is going to talk on Day of Judgment. He's going to look at you and me. He says, don't blame me. Blame yourself. ما كان لي عليكم من سلطان. I had no power over you. إلا except دعوتكم. I called you. فاستجبتم لي. You answered. Don't pray. There's still time. You said yes. Let's keep looking at the uh, the social media with all the haram. You said yes. Right? Don't put your hijab. You said yes. Let's do this. You said yes. I had no, no control over you. I called you, you answered. Don't blame me. Blame yourself. I will not come to your rescue. And you will not help me. Do you want to be that person? Can I afford it? Do I have an answer? Let me give you, and I will end up with this, some examples. And you, and, and you just look at yourself. And there's a book called Sifatu Safwa, the special of the special. And there is a whole volume about men and a volume about women. And the volume about women, half of it have no names. And some of the men's side has no names. They call it Abida. Abida, you know what? A she worshiper. So let's look at some of them. Some of them has names and some I'm not. And this is a woman said the following. And see, where are we? She said, I am so surprised. This is a woman. I'm so surprised that an eye can sleep and knows 
There is a long sleep waiting for her. What makes you say this? What makes you say this? This is not something comes you read. This is not something you think of. This is something you feel and you ponder and you live that you cannot but think this way. This is a woman, her focus is, her focus is, Akhira, Jannah. I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to be there. Qala, kam labithtum fil ardi adada sinin. Allah said this in Surah Al-Mu'minun. How long you lived in this life? We're going to be asked. And we're going to say, Qalu labithna yawman aw ba'da yawm. Fas'alil adin. And we will say, Ya Allah, we lived a day or two. Ask those who are counting. Qala, in labithtum illa qalila. And thou kuntum ta'lamun. You stayed little at the time, but you didn't know. Focus. You want to be the best. You want to worship Allah. You want success in this dunya. You want success in the akhirah. Don't waste your energy about everything else. Focus on Him and Him only. Those of you who were studying with us in the year of knowledge, they have heard this statement from me probably, I think now we are a thousand times. And I always say this, and I say this to myself before anyone. Everything, everything you do, you say, you don't do, you don't say, has to go through this circle. And this circle is Allah. Subhanah. Is he okay with it? Is he happy with it? Then go. If he is not, the answer is no. Even if this whole world or say yes, then you are the best. Then you are Sayyidah Aisha. Then when Allah tests you, you will respond, Wallahu al-musta'an wa ala ma tasifun. And Allah will help me. And when you talk about Sayyidah Maryam, and I was listening to it, beautifully said, you know what came to my mind? Why did Allah choose her? The, the verse that was shared with you was in Ali Imran. But if you read the page before, if you read the page before, before Allah said, Ya Maryam, inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa'il alameen. Before Allah told her, Maryam, you're chosen. What did he say? The page before. Kullama dakhala alayha zakariya al-mihraba wajada indaha rizqa. Every time Sayyidina Zakariya enter, enter where? Where? Watching TV? On her WhatsApp? Talking with her friends? Shopping? It's not, it's not funny. It's painful. You know why? Because I want to be like Sayyidah Maryam. But I want the end. I don't want to go through the path. I want to be like Sayyidah Aisha. And I think it's the other people. Problem, it's the other people putting me this. No. I don't want to go through that path. I want the quick result. I don't want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and stand on my feet and do two hours of qiyam. So Allah looks at me and says, Stafay tuki. I chose you. La. But I can do three hours on the internet, chatting, going through. So the best is the examples you heard all day today. But the question has to be, what do I need to do in this day and age to be them, to get that result? And I will end up with this. And I remind myself of this verse almost daily, if not more. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Those who struggle, look at the word, jihad, Allah used jihad. It's not about fighting. There's no war here. Jahad, struggle, fina, for Allah. He will take you, guide you. Don't worry. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha illahu. And I said by his name, if I was a Sayyidah Maryam and you were Sayyidah Aisha, Wallahi al-Masajid will be open to us. 
it will, we will have our beautiful places. You know why? Because he will make it happen. But he wants to see it me first. I want it, and I'm ready to work for it, and I'm ready to give up things for him. You do that and see the wonders Allah will show you. But you want to be in your comfort zone, and you don't want to be different as beautifully you heard what difference is mean. I lived it also. When you are the only woman, the only, the only, and I'm sure you lived it too, the only, the only woman in that room looks this way. The only woman in that room doesn't speak this way. The only woman in that room. And I kept on saying, Tawbah lil You know what, what I just said? Ja'al Islam gharibah wa sayaudu gharibah. Islam came as a stranger and will come back as a stranger. Look around you. Aren't we strangers? And what did he say to you and me and every stranger? Tawbah lil it's a place in Jannah. Don't you want to be that person? Why do you worry? Why do you waste your energy? Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa arzuqna attiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatila wa arzuqna ishtinaba Rabbana la tuzuq qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahma innaka anta al-wahhab Rabbi alhamni rujdi wa qini sharra nafsi Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Kareem, Ya Hiyu, Ya Qayyum anta tara makanana, you see our place wa tasma'u kalamana and you hear our voices and what we are saying Ya Allah, arina al-haqqa haqqa show us truth as truth and show and help us to follow it. Show us falsehood as falsehood and help us to stay away from it. Innaka Samirun, Qareebun, Mujibu Dua. Jazakum Allahu Khairan, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi tasliman kathira. Ameen takbir. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Fatsabarakallah, Allahumma barak fiki ya Rabb. MashaAllah, it's such a, do you feel this too, this serenity, this kind of like beautiful calm on the heart that Dr. Haifa has this beautiful gift. Fatsabarakallah, Fatsabarakallah, what a beautiful way, what a beautiful way to wrap up our conference, subhanAllah. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. I'm going to start with, because I remember the question I got before my session, by the time the, uh, be my beautiful teachers all um, get theirs. So the question was, if I remember very well, is how do you get education as a woman, Islamic education as a woman, and add to it the usual question of balance. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I am a working person, I have my in-laws, uh, or I have, my, have my parents, you know, this is all reality, very few of us. Here is like, you know, it's only you, or maybe you and your husband. So where do you go? Where do you start? Anything you make it a goal and a priority, with Allah's help, it will work. But you also have to be realistic, meaning, I am not 18-year-old in college studying Islamic studies. I am not, right? Where I have my 16-hour study from day to morning to evening, no. So you put your priorities. What will make you in peace, live in peace, is when you learn that everything you do in your home and at work, as long as it's halal and pleasing to Allah with the right intention is your act of worship. Don't look at cooking to your children as I'm wasting my time. I need to be on my sajada. You didn't get it. Because Allah said you need to take care of your children and we need to eat. However, having said that, I'm not gonna spend three hours cooking because I'm gonna get tired. So you need to be efficient, put your priorities. And as time changes, you will see more and more time. For example, I always wanted to memorize the Quran, but I was a resident in OBGYN. I did literally 16 to 18 hours a day. Good luck, absolutely. But I know I wanted, and I know Allah will give it to me, al yaqeen And I know he will open the opportunity. So the first thing I did, once I finished my residency, started the journey, half an hour a day. Take, put as what you need to do, including taking care of yourself, of course, and 20 minutes of a study. And what is a study? There is a passive and there's active. You know this way. Passive, you're listening to lectures. Now, this is passive, you don't put much effort. You're listening to a YouTube, it's good. But this is not what will really make you learn. You need to sit down and open that book that you don't like. 
tell me about it, right? And then you have to highlight everything that you don't understand. And you have to go and read again and again. And it's a journey. It doesn't happen. It's, there's no Burger King meal in Islamic education. That's how I call it. Yeah, I always say this. You know what? You want to come, order. I want to be a hafidah. Then you come in, pick up. The Quran is in your heart. Doesn't work this way. <laughs> Wallahi. I wish it would be very easy. That's why Allah said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا It will take time, 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 and sabr, right? As, as Imam Abu Hanifa, it's a beautiful statement. He said about his student, I think it was Muhammad al-Shaybani. Um, the meaning, he was giving a fatwa, and he was there, and the fatwa was not right at the answer. And he was not giving him yet the permission to give the fatwa. So he said to him, you want to be a grape, and you have not even yet a small green, husrum, the small baby uh, grape, meaning it takes time. And, and this will make you all very happy. If I die, and this is what I said to myself when I started the journey, if I'm going to die, Allah knows. If he gave me life, I'll continue. And he will reward me as if I finished. Don't give up. Be organized. Don't waste your time. Woman, woman, don't waste your time. Kitchen, anything I can do in 30 minutes, don't do it in 35. You're wasting your time. Anything is not necessary, don't do it. Focus, put Allah and Jannah in front of you and see wonders will happen be Allah. Bismillah. Um, so the question was about, we heard a lot of female companions and how things, quote, should be, and our reality is different. How do we get to the place where we're actually supposed to get? SubhanAllah, first of all, try, don't try to do it alone. Like, you're not the only one that's going through this. Inshallah, we can do it together. Slow, consistent, steady kindness builds community. Like, mashallah, we were talking about the Rahma Foundation for 10 years every Thursday night. Friday night, sorry, my bad. Friday night, I just moved here in my defense. <laughs> every week, like I remember in my community, we had a 10-year halakha every week. That little drop, one drop at a time, eventually it breaks through the rock. SubhanAllah, so that's one thing. But the other thing, just talking, because we mentioned about talking, sorry, having more than one person doing it together. Do you guys know the ayah in the Quran that says two female witnesses? For years, and I was like, ya Allah, but why? I never quite understood it until I was sitting on the board of the masjid and every time the men would get into like a big ego fight of who's more manly, they didn't care that I was sitting there. When we were figuring things out and we just need to get stuff done, we were just getting stuff done. But when it turned into an ego fight, I was invisible. And every time I would sit there and I'm like, Ya Allah, if only I had another woman. And suddenly clicked in my head and I was like, okay, this is a situation where she's far more likely to get dismissed. If people are fighting over the money and it's a big deal and they were supposed to write it down because that's what the ayah is telling you and they didn't write it down and now they're bringing these witnesses and there's one woman and there's one man or like, do women know anything about money anyway? Right? We all know this. We've all been in meetings where you're like, let's get lunch. And then Bob says, let's get lunch. And everybody's like, great idea, Bob. <laughs> and if you say, I said, let's get lunch, you would be like, okay, but don't be petty, really. Like, who cares about getting the credit, right? But then you have a second woman that's literally there to echo what you said. The women in the Obama administration used to do this. They called it echoing. So Sakina's my friend. Sakina says, let's get lunch. I immediately respond and say, Sakina just said, let's get lunch. Whether I agree with it or not, that's not the point. The point is I'm literally lifting up my sister's voice. And we keep doing this. Kam min fi'atin qalila. How often has a small group changed something big? Also, غَلَبَتْ فِئَةٍ كَثِيرًا Like overcome a larger group, but also the reality is the vast majority of people want a healthy community where their families can thrive, where their children can thrive. It's usually just one person that's just yelling louder than everyone else. We don't have to yell at people. Anyways, organize yourselves. Just, just, I loved what she said, but those of you, because many of you came, says we listened to you on Tuesday. Tuesday program started 2000. Seven women in the masjid only. One of them was me. And see where you are. Exactly, I loved it. Persistent, drop by drop, 
don't give up, and, and don't forget the most important factor. Allah will help you. If your intention is pure, wonders will come. Well, since we're talking about taking things one step at a time, I'll use this question, I'll take this question next, inshallah, which is about um, exactly the same kind of thing. Let's say that there was an ideal Muslim state in 2020. Ha, mashallah, sorry. <laughs> but let's just say, right, theoretically. What would a woman be able to do to be the state head or the finance minister? All right, now you remember earlier I shared about as she fought, right? She fought al Adawiyah, who was the first finance minister in Islam, okay? Now, the question here is, what would it take? What would it take for such a thing to happen? Now, this could be a whole lecture in itself, but what else does the question say? It says, how is it possible for her to have such a high position and responsibility while having Islamic responsibilities like taking care of children? Then I realized, I didn't tell you in her biography, she has a long biography. Speaking of long biographies, <laughs> mashallah, I didn't share with you that in fact that she was married. In fact, she married twice. And that she did have children and was a mother as well. People want to know these details because they matter, <laughs> right? And because it adds multiple layers to who she is and how what the question is asking here, how do you balance this? Okay, let's, let's finish the question, then I'll come to this. It said, if I understood you correctly, that woman should ask help from her husband and her family. But if she's neglecting her Islamic responsibility, is she res neglecting her Islamic responsibilities in taking such a high level position? It depends. No, I'm not talking about Shifa, I'm talking in general. You're asking me in the current time and age, if a person takes a high level position of leadership, does it automatically mean that she's neglecting her family or shirking her Islamic duties and responsibilities? The answer is, it depends, because she might. And she may do very well here, and everybody taps her on the shoulder and applauds her and says, go you, go you, you do you, you do you, and all this, all this stuff. <laughs> all right, that's, I'm telling you, this current era is one that says, you go girl, whatever you're doing, you go girl. No, you don't go, inshallah, <laughs> in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always. Sometimes, yes. And sometimes, no. Because people can applaud you all they want. But ultimately, is what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see when he looks at you? This is where the circles of priorities that I was talking about matter. This is why I spent so much time talking about it. Because the book that uh, Sada Maryam was quoting about the woman, the hadith about woman, right? That was banned in Saudi Arabia, subhanAllah, and other places I imagine too, that just quotes the Sahih Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. He says in there very accurately, the, the author, he says, if she, you know, if she masters her circles of priorities, there are no issues with her working in any other of those fields, of those circles. There's no issue. And this depends on each and every person because some people are excellent multitaskers, excellent at multitasking, and others are pretty terrible at it. Some people are terrible multitaskers, but they have a lot of hands helping them, right? It really depends, subhanAllah. So if a person is taking a high level of responsibility and leadership, it doesn't automatically mean that she's neglecting her family. It may be that subhanAllah, Allah gifted her with the ability to be very organized or the ability to have lots of help. Because any person you look at and you say, whoa, how does she do it? Never ask that question because it's never that person doing it alone. There's always a whole, whole team of people to allow that leader to do what they're doing if they really are a balanced leader. Does that make sense? And when they are not balanced, which are, is the case actually of many of our leaders, you start seeing it crop up. You see the house is falling apart. You see the kids are off doing I don't know what. You see the spouse is upset with this. You see this crumbling here and that crumbling there. And you see all kinds of mismanagement, not just in a person, person's personal life, but also mismanagement of the community's time and the community's money and the community's efforts and all kinds of stuff. It all goes together, subhanAllah. So anyhow, I invite us, inshallah, to take inspiration from our role models 
and I asked the question in the lecture and I'll ask it again. Do we question the wisdom of Sayyidina Umar for putting Shifa al-Adawiyya as the Minister of Finance? Would any man or woman today question the wisdom of Umar? He knew she was married, he knew she had children, and he knew <laughs> that she was the master of the fiqh of finances and the master of the person who can go into the souq and say, out with you, you don't know how to do this business transaction properly, and out with you, you are scamming people. He knew who he chose. Why are we questioning this? Inshallah, we get inspiration from that. Barakallahu See how capable we are? We're doing tech right here on stage, right here. <laughs> MashaAllah. Yeah, multitask. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. The question I had was about, um, you know, the hadith that I mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, he loves beauty, he is beauty. And then it's kind of a conflict or a conflicting message that we shouldn't emphasize our beauty. So how can we balance that? And um, as my slides, uh, as I, I referenced in the slides, the point of um, you know be uh, focusing or or uh, you know the pursuit of beautification should really be about the inward, right? We want to focus on inward beautification, and that doesn't mean, of course, that we don't take care of our exterior. The Prophet was known, if you study his sirah, for always looking the best, even though he had very little. He took great care to present himself in the most beautiful way. That you know meant uh, oiling, uh, using oil, using uh, perfume, um, always having you know again just the best uh, presentation, hygiene. Of course, where did we learn how to do? All all of these things was from his sunnah. So all of that is to say that, if, yes, we're permitted to um, spend time beautifying ourselves, and even within our marriages, we should, right? There should be a balanced, um, reciprocated thing between both the husband and the wife. However, if that's all you do, or that's your primary focus, and you place so much of your value on beautification, this is where there's a problem. And in this society, this is the toxic messaging that we're getting as women, that you have to be a certain size, your hair has to look a certain way, your skin has to look a certain way, your eye color, you should be at the gym every day. And you see a lot of women, I was telling them, um, Actually, the other day, my son and I drove to the supermarket early because we had to get milk, and it was after Fajr. And, you know, we, alhamdulillah, had prayed, and then we stayed awake. So when we left to go get milk, it was still, you know, dark outside somewhat. And so I just, I saw a bunch of people on the street running. There were a lot of activity at, at this time, right? It's a very blessed time, Fajr. But you could see that a lot of the people were up doing what? They were out there focusing on, right, the exterior. Uh, so they were doing their exercise, and then I saw one guy, he was uh, putting something in the trunk of his car, and when he came out, he looked like he had just come from the gym. You know, he just kind of had that gym look. He looked sweaty, red. <laughs> okay, so I was like, he must have just come from the gym, and I said, SubhanAllah, and I told my son, I said, you know, it's amazing that so many people will wake up really early in the morning to go to the gym. They will go out of their way to go to the gym. They'll, they'll wake up from their sleep to do that. They'll wake up from their sleep, right, to straighten their hair for one to two hours. I know people who do this. It is their morning beauty routine to wake up super early so that they get their hot, whatever, you know, their ironing, their, um, what is it called? I totally forgot now. Their flat iron, thank you. Their flat iron ready, and then get their makeup ready. You gotta, of course, shower and do all that, but there's all this beautification, but they won't pray. They don't pray to Allah. They don't, they, they, they just don't pray. So this is where we have it backwards. So the point again is we are permitted to beautify ourselves, but priority has to be inward beautification, character development, making sure we're ridding ourselves of the diseases of the heart, making sure we're learning and studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, implementing that, being people who embody as much as we are able to uh, the, the Quranic, uh, you know, the, the Quran in our, in our words, in our actions. That's real beautification. So. I hope that's clear. Alhamdulillah. Oh, yes. Sister, are you ready? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Both for the live. Both for the live. Okay, thank you. All right. I did. 
and I didn't get through all of them. Um, so one, uh, there's uh, quite a few questions, and so one of them was so, asking also about um, in what ways can sisters help the African American community um, and African American Muslims? I'm going to ask a question, and I think that the first piece is is really self education. You know about learning. Um, the, the history, the gaining knowledge and things like that so that it can help to change the, um, the narrative that had been given to us, whether it's in school, society, wherever we got the narrative from our own families, is to alter the narrative and that comes with, um, with retraining ourselves first. And the other piece, too, is that begin to change the way that we may look at our sisters, our African-American sisters, like, um, and, and, and look at that in terms of um, uh, positive aspects that we are contributors to Islam. We're contributors to our community more so um, than we may have thought before. So that part is really important. Um, and there was another question about um, the social justice aspect of it. And I think there's one piece around really um, also being mindful of yourself and your health with really getting into the social uh, justice movement and things like that and helping with the African American community is being mindful because that, I was speaking with someone earlier who came to me to speak uh, before, it can be really draining. Um, when really looking at a lot of those, the pressures and the negatives that happen as we focus on, focus on Islam, focus on um, Allah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our, and our, and our health. Um, and knowing that we can't do it all, you know, to pace ourselves. Um, so I will hand it over to someone else and then I'll come back around to me to answer some of the other questions. Thank you, Alhamdulillah, Prophet Muhammad. The question is, our local masjid, three of them all run by the same board, don't offer any support for sisters' events. They don't allow us to use the masallas or conference rooms to hold women's gatherings. What do you advise? How can we facilitate such gatherings with such a big pushback? Many of us have experienced this and others, alhamdulillah, go to MCC, and that is the solution, mashallah. <laughs> Uh, alhamdulillah, we see, the, we see the market difference of being able to have, um, you know, going to the masjid and reciting Qur'an together, having your children grow up in the masjid. It's a very different experience for our children to be able to see their mothers coming and learning and, you know, knowing other women. My husband was telling me that one of his favorite memories of being a kid is just going with his mom and running around the masjid and just experiencing the masjid in that way. And that's very interesting because a lot of us, you know, we're in the women's section and we see children running around and we're like, we can't concentrate on the prayer because there's so much noise. And so there's all these different aspects of, you know, womanhood that that converge into this one space. And when we don't feel like we even have the opportunity to experience that space with our other sisters, of course that's very hurtful. And when you've already spoken to the board and you've already written letters and you've already sent emails and you've gone to the board meeting and you've spoken to the imam and nothing is changing, I would recommend two things, and I know that the scholars here have way better suggestions, inshallah they can give advice, but the first is, don't let go of your connection to the masjid, even though you have pain. And that's been really a journey for myself, and I know many other women who, um, you know, we need to separate the difference between this is the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I come here to worship Allah, and this is my, my, my space of um, connecting with other believers and helping my family connect with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then any negative experiences I may have, that's where I go into my sajda. In my sujood, I go to Allah and I ask him to help heal me and help heal my community. And of course, therapy is very helpful, especially if you can work with a Muslim therapist. Maristan is here who can help you process why those things are so hurtful sometimes. So one on a personal level, don't let go of your connection with the masjid. If the masjid is open to women, don't let go of it. The second thing is, they might be open in the prayer hall, but that doesn't mean that they are open to you having social gatherings or religious gatherings. And if you want to hold your halaqa in the masjid, but they're not opening the doors for you, I would recommend two things. One, 
find an alternative space. It can be your own home. A sister that I know in, um, in Santa Clara holds open halakha in her backyard. Uh, you know, she, she publicizes it. People know her address. And women come all the way from Berkeley, I think some of the women here even, come all the way from Berkeley just to be able to be with other women in, in a woman's backyard. And that speaks to, you know, subhanAllah, how committed women are to seeking knowledge and being in spaces of worship. So one is finding alternative spaces. But the second is you have power in your masjid. You're, you yourself are a donator or maybe someone you know is. And you can speak with them and say, you know, I would like to donate this amount to the masjid, but it's contingent on women being able to have religious classes in the masjid. So you put that pressure on the board from a financial space that, you know, the masjid is for all of us. Myself, my children are not going to be able to learn if you are literally saying we cannot have Quran halaqas in the masjid. So we are not going to be giving this money here. Instead, we're going to rent a room in a you know random facility to be able to have our own halaqas. So either this money goes to the masjid and you allow us to wor worship in the masjid, or we're going to rent out a room in an office space, excuse me, and we're going to give that money to an office space so that we can feel safe where we worship together without feeling like we are not welcome. You have power to do that, and you have the resources to be able to do that. When you, th you think critically about the ways that you do matter, you are necessary for the masjid, even if you don't feel like you are, even if you're made to feel like you're not, and how can you help them realize that? And at the end of the day, they may never realize that. And that's when you go back to point one, that you still go back to the masjid and you pray for the healing of yourself and your community, and maybe it's time to find a different masjid in your locality where you do still have that connection, but in a different place. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> this question is a tough one, so I'm giving you a warning. And it's very practical, it's very common. So I'm gonna read it so I, I give it do right. How do we as women, especially getting married young and questioning both cultural and religious understanding of Islam, navigate the definition of qawama that usually is explained as quote unquote wife has to be obedient in turn for financial support from husband and that's that's the extent of the role what is the way we as women should understand this role men play and what does it look like to obey as a wife this needs a whole next uh, yeah, whole conference. No, I really mean this. This is going to be the next one. Because we agreed that we're going to tackle every sensitive issue. Because if we are not going to be talking about it, who else is going to talk about it? Right? And we need to, in general, this is very difficult. There's a couple of things in Islam. And I'm saying this as a woman. It's very difficult on the woman. What is the second one? Very difficult. You don't see it in this country because it's not allowed. Polygamy. Yeah, when I was in Saudi, this was a huge issue because it's very hard for the woman. So, come to reality. Number one, you need to understand what is qawama and what is the requirement for qawama in general. When I shared with you the story of Sayyida Aisha, right? How did she respond? And there's nobody stronger than Sayyida Aisha. If you, if you really read her biography, right? She stood up for her right, she speaks her mind, she acted as a wife, she was jealous, she planned. You all know this, right? Right? How did she respond? Was she an obedient wife? Answer me. No or yes? Yes. Was she weak? Was she submissive and let them say whatever they say? What can I do? You know, he, they, he, he pays for me. What did she do? Turn to Allah. This is what we are missing. I need to understand what is qawama. I need to understand where does qawama apply? Does Allah expect me to be the obedient wife? Yes, to a certain extent. It's not an open invitation. Otherwise, Allah knows our ability and our limitation. And marriage will be, honestly, almost impossible. But is it also exactly what you just said? Open invitation, no for everything, this is your mind. Fifth, you know the 50-50 rule? 
You don't know the 50-50? I'm not going to say it in public. <laughs> Honestly. So we don't want to go to the extremes. Now, you should probably know. It's, you shouldn't be the extreme. He does this, I does this. If he doesn't do it, I'm not doing it. That's not, that's not going to work. What? The hadith I had actually in my mind, but the time didn't allow it. That's the hadith of Rasulullah And you translate it as, as the following. The women are but partners of the, of the men. So here you go. What does it will take if I am going to give him the qawama? Because Allah told me, provided he is qualified to do the qawama. The 50-50, the joint uh, account, is not a qawama. You need to read the Qur'an. The qawama is because he spent on her. There's no 50-50. There is no joint account. If you are the richest woman, it's your money. If that's how it is in your home, then yes. You obey him as long as there's no disobedience to Allah. As long as there's no abuse. It's, it's not a yes and no right away, you know. The culture is telling us no, and the, we think it's not us yes. And that's where the conflict. You need to learn, and you need to be patient, and you need to navigate, and you need to put your mind, the goal after pleasing Allah, can I save this marriage? Can I be this woman? We need to have a lot of talk about marriage before they get married. The, 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 and I'm sure Dr. Uh, 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 Rania knows this, the percentage of divorce in the Muslim community is getting very close to the non-Muslim. It's 47%. I had a woman came to my house, knocked on the door, gave me the invitation, and says, please make dua. So of course I'm making, I said, please make dua, they stay married. Wallahi, I was like, subhanAllah. So qawama has a requirement from the man, has a requirement from the woman, is not do or don't. The other one, what does Allah expect from us, us as obedient wives? toward the husband, qawam, because we want to please Allah, but that usually gets dressed up in a cultural baggage, which is so true. And I'd like to understand the actual expectation to not feel guilty. This is definitely going to be our next, uh, yeah, because this is a long subject. So inshallah, if Allah allows, make dua, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this to happen. This, by the way, was started in November in a simple conversation. And she said, really? I said, sure. <laughs> and here we are, subhanAllah. And may Allah reward you for all coming because you made it reality. Jazakumullah khair. So inshallah, next time we will tackle another. She is, by the way, we have to uh, acknowledge, she was the one who wrote the descriptions. It was beautiful descriptions, really. Really, I mean, we talked about the subject, but exactly, you know, the best, the better, the equal. So may Allah reward. Um, so there was a question about um, just books in terms of like learning about women. There's the women around the Prophet ﷺ. There's a, if you want something that's deeply philosophical, the Tao of Islam, the source book on, no oh, shoot, it, the Tao of Islam. It's, it's discussing a lot of the Sufi ideas of like, what does womanhood mean? Am I a woman in my soul? A lot of those discussions, she actually wrote it from an Eastern perspective because the Western perspective was apparently too difficult to, to work with where she was saying like, I, I would go through all of these th discussions on like, you have to understand the Islamic ethos for you to understand how and why these rulings come about. And it was so difficult that she's like, I have to come, I have to literally cross the ocean, come from an Eastern perspective to be able to explain it. But I do want to say a lot, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful for female teachers. We have just as many female teachers in our communities as we do men. We just don't value their scholarship in the same way. We don't have a lack of this. And this is on every subject. Like I learned about like structural racism because I asked aunties in the masjid. I went to my aunties and I said, I, I know I'm at, like, also, when you make a mistake and someone schools you, thank you, thank them for the free education. Because I didn't, I didn't know things. I, di I didn't actually, for a good chunk of my life, I didn't live in America. I had no idea. And then I would like, wait, other sisters don't know this. Come to the halakha. <laughs> Please teach us. Because how are we going to support each other if we don't know each other? 
and we don't value the scholarship that we have. I just, I know I'm tangenting, but there was a discussion on polygamy. I think it's important for us to make sure that we are putting it, again, within, within its context. The Prophet ﷺ married a number of women after the Battle of Uhud. They lost 7% of their male population in a day. This was a devastating day. And the stories about the Battle of Uhud, it's very difficult to get through them with, with, without just sobbing. The companions' children, radiallahu anhum, would come out and call for their fathers and cry when they didn't hear a response. They knew what happened. So the Prophet ﷺ started marrying a series of widows. When you look at a community that's under attack, because you're living in peace, you don't judge a community that's living under attack. Communities at war are different from communities at peace. And I want to say this because polygamy in, in, in America is far more common within the black community than it is in the immigrant community. Because one in four black men between the ages of 18 and 28 is in prison or on parole. This is a community under attack. And this isn't to say it's a blanket statement. Not every woman will, is willing to live with it. Some women, regardless of their backgrounds. In, in Yemen, it's actually very common. Like my, my sister-in-law's neighbor was trying to find her husband, his second wife. She's like, I might as well like her. And I was like, this is the craziest thing I've heard in my life. Different cultures do different things. The women in Mecca were willing to accept it. The women in Medina weren't. The Prophet ﷺ never insulted the women of Medina by taking more than one wife from Medina. It wasn't a part of their culture. And all of that is fine. We don't, I just want to make sure that we're not judging a community at war that is under attack the same way that we would judge a community in a place of peace. If Allah has gifted you something, alhamdulillah, don't look at your sister that's in a different situation and be like, oh, but I'm better. Ask her what that experience is like. She might enjoy her marriage far more than you ever dreamt of. And I've talked to some of these sisters. It's like, wow, yours sounds so amazing. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Dr. Amina. All right, mashallah. This question, alhamdulillah, there's so, there's so many questions and so many beautiful questions. How on earth are we going to do this, this all before Maghrib? I have no idea. So we're going to do our best. We're going to consolidate, take another round of, one more round maybe before Maghrib comes in. It's tiny.cc backslash reimagined questions. Excellent, your neighbor has it, alhamdulillah. All right, alhamdulillah. This question here reads, some of the women that were mentioned today as examples can be viewed as anomalies. Okay, I love this, because as soon as I read it, I was like, aha, I knew somebody was gonna ask this. I knew somebody was going to say, oh yeah, yeah, I know, but those are the greats. Does this actually apply to me? So the question goes, or that they were women who were present in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, which is also a very common thing that people say. But they were Sahabiyat. Who are we? Okay, hang on. And we are not debating that they are the best of the generations. This is clear from the hadith. However, or, <laughs> then it continues, or they were Sahabiyat. Yes, okay, you got that. Or they were so special and better, in us, better than us that they are at a different level that we will never reach. How do we talk about this? I'll tell you exactly how we talk about this. The reason we decided in this, or at least in my talk, I decided to bring examples of the Prophet's wife and examples of the Sahabiyat was specifically because the topic itself had to do with the concept of, my topic was, stay at home. Do women, shouldn't women stay at home? And I was giving examples because people are going to say, is there proof in the Prophet's era that woman did more than stay at home? I said, well, who better than the very woman of the Prophet's era, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his very wives, ridwan allahi alayhin, to actually explain. But that does not mean that in all of Muslim history that there weren't so many examples. Sisters, you have to hear these stories and understand that there were so many of them, yani ubiquitous, to where these are not anomalies. They are not. And I'll tell you, and this is why I'm so happy to say that, because anytime I get to share about Damascus, I love it. <laughs> because for me, for me, I had to, the, the honor of being able to see this in real life. The people who are present, I don't know who was in the halak on Friday night a couple weeks ago, 
I got so frustrated, it's not with the sisters, but with the questions that people ask about where are the female scholars? And I would explain and explain, and finally I just said, you know what, I turned off my, my uh, green screen behind me and there was my bookshelf, right? And I just pointed at my bookshelf and I said, you see these shelves over here? You see these shelves behind me? There were rows and rows and rows of books and I said, every single one of these is a modern, currently living, or just recently deceased, female scholar. You want fiqh, you want hadith, you want the qira'at of Qur'an, you want tajweed, you want sirah, you want it, 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 everything. It's all right there on the shelf. And they were all women of Damascus in one place, one country. What if we added to it all the countries of the world? Fatabarakallah, what you said was so true. We may not know the women scholars, because sometimes they're the auntie who is in the community who you learn structural racism from, and nobody calls her a doctor, ustada, blah, blah. <laughs> with honorific titles, but she has more knowledge on that topic than anyone else, right? And then what about all of our teachers that actually have knowledge and either we don't know them, simply, the gems, the hidden gems of our community, or they ha don't have a platform, which is what Rahma Foundation is, a platform for all the women of Stadas to speak from. A whole, they don't have a whole organization backing them or masajid opening their doors to them. Or that simply, we are so used to, just like the question about the Qur'an apps and listening to men who read the Qur'an, beautiful recitations, we're so accustomed to listening to a man reciting Qur'an, we've never even heard a woman recite Qur'an. SubhanAllah, right? And so let me just tell you this, these are not anomalies, back to the question. What I saw, SubhanAllah, was a beautiful story of balance. A story of women who had, if Allah blessed them with a spouse, were married, and from those who are married, if Allah blessed them with children, were mothers. But every single one of them, without exception, whether she was a wife or not, whether she was widowed or divorced, whether she was single or never married, whether she had children, 10 of them or one, they had one thing in common always. They were dedicated to the knowledge of Islam. They learned their Islam. These women, it doesn't matter, the, the primary level was they all had memorized the Quran. Every single last one of them had ijaz and Qur'an. And then there are those who went further up and memorized a hadith. And eventually got ijaz as in the, all the books of hadith. And those who became the ten ashar qira'at of Qur'an. Right, and on and on and on, subhanAllah. And we're not talking in the ones or ten, twenties or thirties anomalies, we're talking in the hundreds. It was a whole movement, it was beautiful. It still is, these are currently living people, though they may not all be in Damascus today, make du'a for Syria and all of the countries of the Muslim world and the world by extension. The reason I'm sharing this with you sisters is because we tend to think of anomalies. Let me tell you, after I came back from studying in Syria, one of the trips back, I had actually spent so much time studying with women teachers, and at a young age, I was a teenager when I first started, I went to my first mixed, yeah, I mean mixed as in like, had like women were on one side and men were on the other side program. It was a month long intensive dean program. And I was like, huh, this is interesting. <laughs> they were all male teachers, it's actually quite a funny story. They were all male teachers. There wasn't a single woman teacher. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'd never really heard too many male teachers speak, whatever. So each one was getting up and giving his lecture. Each one was getting up, give his lecture. <laughs> and after like a day's worth of this, this shows you how naive and kind of silly. I was still very young. I'm sitting in the front row. The problem is I'm sitting in the front row. <laughs> and I listened to each of them, each of them, each of them. Okay, halas, we have a whole day worth of male teachers speaking. Beautiful teachers, mashallah. And finally, I turned around to the sister sitting on this side of me and the sister sitting on this side, and I said, huh, how strange. They're all men. <laughs> and I said, you know, they're not so bad. They're just not as good as the women teachers. <laughs> and the sister sitting next to me, I will not forget the look on their faces. They looked at me like, what planet did you just come off of? that you know more women teachers and scholars that it's the weird anomaly that the male ones are speaking. And that was my reality. All of the women were teachers. All the women were, all the teachers that we had were women, subhanAllah. Scholars, scholars. Alhamdulillah, Allah allowed me to keep going back to Damascus. I did study with the men and the shaykh as well of Damascus. Beautiful, mashallah. But something special about that. 
to where you can take a young kid and put her in a program and go, huh, strange, male teachers, <laughs> shallah, right? Right? I had a friend, very similar, sorry, tangent here, but she had lived all her life overseas, and so her hockey team was all women, all girls in a Muslim country. And when she moved to Canada, they went to their first like official hockey game. And so, you know, when you, when you have the mask on and you're, everyone's playing, you can't see if they're a male or a woman, a man, a man or a woman. And so eventually they took their helmets off and she goes, oh, they're men. <laughs> exact same reaction. It depends what you saw. It depends what you grew up with. It depends what you were able, Allah gave you the ability to see. Sisters, these examples are not anomalies. They are more ubiquitous than we think. And they absolutely can and should and will be you and your daughters, inshallah ta'ala. And so there was another question that came into the, the chat that asked about the uh, exam that I talked about, the licensing exam. And so this one sort of, I'll just, it's a long one, just uh, ask about, um, the, the question is, is, is race, basically about um, racism and how I saw the lens of it when looking at it. I'm re-paraphrasing the question because it's a really long one. And about what, you know, if white people read the question and said, oh, it's exemplifying white people and they feel horrible about that on the exam as well. And so the, the writer um, talked about um, it's better to think about, basically about, um, but I think empower African American community comes from a place of talking about great things that, um, that have done and focus on the positive mental shift alongside strategically fighting against racism. And so basically I think the pe what I'm surmising from this is really focusing on um, the positives that happen within the African American community versus the, the struggles and the pain. Um, we need both. Okay, so we have to acknowledge the pain and the torture that happened in this country um, for over 400 years. That's a real thing. There is still suffering that comes because of enslavement and the torture that happened in this country for African American people and realize that those people were Muslim. Many of them that came over, you know, that were forced into enslavement were also Muslims. So we're reverting back. So it's not necessarily looking at the negatives of it. I think we need to look at both. Um, and look at the positives and the powerful achievements that has happened and hasn't happened. Like, un, like hidden figures. We talk about some folks who saw that movie about the strength of women. Um, and even like the sister was just speaking about many of the scholars. Many of the scholars with, that did a lot of the writing too um, also come from African countries as written in the language of Wolof. You know, and spoken in the language of Wolof. So we look at both. I think both is important. And, and then we sit with ourselves and with our own souls about hearing and learning things that are painful and wanting it to go away and move past it. That goes back to what we talked about with race neutrality. And that adds to another question that came in there and about cultural humility was another question that came in there. Cultural humility is the piece about you know, being humbled and learning what it is that we don't know. And, and moving ourselves to learn more and be humble about that. So we need both. Yes, there is the positive and the beautiful parts about African American history. And there is also the pain that is happening right now today. Because if we, if we are blind to it, then it adds to that piece about race and color blindness. And that becomes detrimental and very painful. Whereas folks become also supporters of the oppression rather than those who are fighting against it. So it's, it's a combination of both. And I think I answered three questions in one. <laughs> I think I did, inshallah. That's what I want to come back to. Thank you. So I had, um, and again, I, we apologize for not being able to get to all the questions. There's so many that I wish I could answer, but we just don't have time. So I'm gonna choose this one that I really think I can speak on because it relates to um, uh, an experience that I actually lived through. So the question is, we understand that one can still have ostentation, right, which is, it's a disease of the heart where you show off 
right? You're, you're performing, basically, in order for it to be seen. Um, uh, that we can have ostentation when people purposely go out of their way to not look boastful. Do you still have ostentation if you go out of your way to not look too good around certain people? Uh, an example is where basically wearing a mask around men or purposely dress and purposely dress with not the best attire around certain people out of fear of judgment or being seen by them. So the question again that I'm hearing here is, is it still Riyadh if you're trying to basically, you know, kind of tone down your dress um, uh, so as not to attract uh, or to appear a certain way, right, to whether it's men or, or other uh, people? And uh, so I, I feel like this question, I just again can speak to it because many, many years ago, before I even knew what the term ostentation was, which is like a, you know, it's a mouthful of a word, um, or Riyah, we, I hadn't studied the diseases of the heart. I absolutely had it, I just didn't know I had it. But a big part of my focus was on the outward. And so wearing a certain clothes to not be perceived uh, you know, as, as attractive or, or just to look intimidating was absolutely my game. I went out of the house with the agenda to intimidate people, to look scary, to not be judged um, you know, for, for, a, for any physicality or anything else, um, and to send a message, a strong message. Um, and I thought that that was you know, something pious. I actually believed that it was an act of piety to do that. And I've told this story before, but I don't know how many of you have heard it, so I'll just quickly tell it because I think, it, for me, it was a life-changing moment for me, and it just made me, it helped me to shift focus. But I've told the story, so if you've heard it, you can leave if you want, <laughs> but I don't wanna. Uh, anyhow, I was, this was many years ago, and so as I mentioned, I used to dress like all, uh, kind of military style in a way, uh, head to toe black, and I would walk around, um, with like a grimace and just like not be very pleasant because uh, I wanted to intimidate people. So I was at the airport waiting for a ride and this, um, you know, I'm just sitting there, people watching, waiting for my ride, dressed again, head to toe like that. And a woman, she parks her car right across the street. I mean, uh, on the, you know, in the, in the, where, where all the cars are coming. And she parked her car and then she got, got out of her car and she's wearing a tank top and shorts and she's a you know white I mean, I'm assuming white American woman, but she um, she was dressed very scantily, and I just immediately just judged her and had a lot of negative thoughts. Let's just say, um, completely judged her. And this happened to me. She closed the trunk of her car and she looked right in my direction as if she was piercing through my soul. And you know, if you make eye contact with somebody who you're just judging, you know that's not comfortable, uh, if you've ever done that before. But she did that, and then she walked directly towards me. And so as she's walking towards me, my heart is like, you know, because I'm like, what is this? This is kind of strange. Why is she coming towards me? And uh, wallahi, she did this. She came and she stood in her tank top and short shorts, and I'm sitting there, and she, she put her head down, and she said, Assalamu alaikum. Um, last words I ever thought I would hear from someone dressed like that. And she had so much humility. I actually, she had her head hand the, 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 low the whole time, pretty much she was talking to me. She's like, I know I'm dressed so um, inappropriately, but I am Muslim and um, I wanna raise my son Muslim and I saw you and I thought it was like a sign from God that I come and talk to you because um, I want uh, books. She's like, I need resources for my son. So she's saying all this stuff and I'm just sitting there like completely floored at what just happened because I know the internal dialogue I was having in my head. And of course, Allah knows what I was thinking. And he sent this woman to me. He sent her to me to teach me a very, very serious lesson that day, which is who do you think you are, right? You're walking around as though you are the personification of my faith and you judge people and you think you're better than people. And that's who I was for a really long time. And that day I learned the lesson, I am nobody. Because that woman, I'm sure, was, was far better than I was in that moment. And I, I had to sit with that. And it was like a, um, I say it was, it was like a punch to, to the gut. It was, but it was a huge awakening for me that my focus was on the wrong thing. I was focused on the outward. So Riya is a disease of the heart where in both cases, where you do something to be seen or you don't do something to not be seen, it is riya because the focus is on people. Our focus has to be on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't act 
for, for to be seen or to not be seen, to be judged, to not be judged, to be accepted, to not be accepted. That is not the state of the believer because people can't benefit you and they can't harm you. Everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the believer understands that and that's why if you're going to dress a certain way, do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't factor in people. Do it for the sake of Allah and He will give you tawfiq inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. I just wanted to share, since we only have one minute, um, I, won't have time to answer the, I won't have time to answer the actual question. So instead, I'd like to share something. Um, SubhanAllah, when we're talking about the you know, legacy of our amazing and incredible African-American brothers and sisters, I want you to know that we have a international Dubai Quran competition where every country of the world comes and competes. And we've had three winners from the United States, and all of them are African-American. SubhanAllah, we have Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar in spaces of Qur'an, which is where I do so much research, and women reciting Qur'an. MashaAllah, on the app that we have coming out, inshallah, we have women Qur'an reciters, so many from Nigeria, from Cameroon, from Guinea, mashallah, from the Gambia, and mashallah, their recitations are not just beautiful recitations, they're also reciting Qira'at. So you're going to hear recitations you've never heard before and you don't understand. And I'm going to have just play one of them for you, inshallah, as we end, just to give you a glimpse of the depth of knowledge. Because this isn't just, oh, I go to the masjid and I memorize it from hearing someone. The level of this knowledge is so powerful. And those of us who are not black, we have so much that we owe our brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters, how you so beautifully spoke to this. May Allah bless you to recognize the fact that we who, those of us who are not black, the privilege that we have, and also to recognize that the reason we have so much privilege is because of the sacrifices and the, 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 the pain of our brothers and sisters from the African-American community. But the scholarship that we have from so much of East and West Africa is just so powerful in our, in our, in our history. So I wanna end because subhanAllah, listening to this, it will inshallah blow you away. This is Sheikha Zainab Zailani. She is a, like, mashallah, hafidha with so much, um, a, constantly, a constant winner of Quran uh, um, competitions. And I want you to hear something different than you may have heard before. I just, mashallah, there are so many of them, I need to get to her. Bismillah. <laughs> Mina, in one minute, can you explain what just happened? Um, the first ayah? Just the, what happened to why, why did she say all of those? There's like, no Bismillah rahman rahim between them. Yes, why did she say the last one and the first one? Because she's, she's connecting the two surahs. Sorry, I just that I was sucked into the rest of the sorry, <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Alhamdulillah. I'm sorry. I'm actually out of practice for my qira'at. But mashallah, like at the beginning of the surah, what she was doing was imala. So like the ja'a. They're all different recitations. Sorry? Even that one, mashallah. Okay, actually, do you want to answer? Yeah, can you answer? Come to <laughs> no, no, bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Mashallah, so different types of recitation. So, uh, some of the recitations, they have imala. And they don't say the, the word with fatah, the way we say it in Hafs. So in Hafs, we say ja'a. But Ibn Zakwan says ja'a. So he makes the imala. So this is one of the, one of the ways that differ between the qira'at. And uh, subhanAllah, yani, uh, there are so many differences and um, Imam Shatibi, radiallahu anh, 
um, collected all the differences in the Quran, all the, uh, and he calls it huruf. So when you say harf, it means that it's read differently from one recital to another. Sometimes they agree on certain ones, sometimes they d differ. Some reciters say a nace. Uh, some of them make full ishba' for the mad. They would say, Ida ja'a, six. Some of them say four. So it depends, it's a whole science. And mashallah, the more you learn about the Quran, the more you, you think that you know nothing. And actually, this is about all the sciences of Islam. SubhanAllah. Sorry? No, Bismillah. Some of the reciters, um, for example, Hamza radiallahu an, consider the Quran as a whole. So he doesn't read the best man. Some of them do six different ways, or five different ways, how to connect the surahs. So, for example, I'm going to answer this uh, in a little bit of detail. Let's take. Uh, so some of them would, the first rule is to separate the three uh, positions. They would say, Alif Lam Mim. You separate. Then what you do is you connect Bismillah Rahman Rahim to the beginning of the next ayah. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alif Lam Longer. Meem. But you never connect um, when, uh, when you start the Quran, you never connect A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajim to Bismillah Rahman Rahim so that the one who doesn't know the Quran would not think that uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim is the end of the first surah. So and then you can connect all of them together. And uh, some, some reciters also do sect between the two ayahs. Actually, the sect without Bismillah, so um, that's wrong. Let's connect them together. So different ways of reciting Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Thank you so much, Ansanihat. And um, and speaking of, and this is a wonderful note to end on. I still need this one. But a wonderful note to end on as we wrap up our conference, inshallah, is that um, the recitation, the 10 recitations of Quran, honestly, is something that is a science that we need to continue on. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if anybody here actually has worked on their Quran, worked on their hips, worked on their tajweed, keep on working with the 10 qiraat. And if this, I mean, we have to keep on putting the bar pretty, pretty high, mashallah, to keep on attaining it. I just want to end with saying one of the wonderful modern, like current day, um, I say modern, I mean current day, mashallah, uh, women scholars that I am uh, very blessed, mashallah, to, to be aware of and to know of and actually study from her books is somebody by the name of Anse Samar al-Asha, who's written an amazing multiple volumes on the 10 qira'at where she takes every single verse of the Qur'an and breaks down each and every one of the 10 qira'at and tells you the differences. And then they say that there isn't actually a book, so many of her books are so unique, that there isn't actually a book quite like this. <laughs> that many people have been able to move from their Hafs of Qur'an to learning the 10 Qira'at because they were able to follow her method. 
She's also the same person, mashallah. She's memorized all the books of hadith and has books, an, an amazing book where she actually puts in, um, all it is is like for, for those who memorize all the hadith, imagine you don't just memorize the hadith, which is in itself an amazing feat. You also memorize the an'ana, which is like an so and so, an so and so, an so and so, right? Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the sanad, exactly. And she has these like shortcuts, which are all pictorial. <laughs> Little picture shortcuts of how do you memorize all of the hadith and who was in the sanad. <laughs> <laughs> right? of the sahih of the hadith. I mean, it is phenomenal, mashallah, and many, many books. There is a book that is translated of hers under the title Gatherings of Illumination by Dr. Faryal Salem, who translated the book, and it's a book of dua. So since we're entering into Ramadan, this is one you can go online onto Amazon and actually order it. And it's a beautiful book where she brings together the Quranic du'as and your hadith du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu and other du'as. And actually there's other compilations like this, but this one's done by a woman, mashallah. And it's a very beautiful compilation of du'as. So add to that to your library, inshallah. I end this, inshallah, with more inspirations. And by the way, she also ran the entire hadith school for women in Damascus, mashallah. I mean, this is beautiful. I met, uh, one more thing, I, I, I keep, keep on talking about her. She had students that would come from all over the world, and I met, <laughs> mashallah, our sheikh who gave us the ijazah in Quran and Tajweed, rahimahullah, um, he would have certain people who were given permission to give full ijazah, because usually what you do in the ministry of Syria of the, of the, um, of, for the Quran is you have to go to the person with the shortest sanad, and there's only so many of them. And they were all men. And most of them wouldn't take on women teacher, women students. And subhanAllah, sometime maybe it was in the 70s or 80s or so, some of our teachers were able to finally ask and agree and convince. They actually went to the youngest of the five of the Qur'a of Sham, and he said, no, I don't teach women. They went to the next oldest, no, I don't teach women. They thought the youngest one would be more modern. <laughs> no, 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 no. Until they get to the eldest of them, subhanAllah. And subhanAllah, our teacher, subhanAllah, the one we were blessed to receive ijazah from, took on students and and hundreds i'm talking about in the hundreds of and then into the thousands of women who received the ijazah of quran from syria and the, the quran ijazah of syria is the strongest and the strictest so people would come from all over even after they finished quran elsewhere to get the one from syria this teacher Ansa Samar, that i'm telling you about she had um full permission to give the full ijazah on her own like that's how strong her quran was and I met, mashallah, I will never forget this, one of the housemates I was, on one of my last trips was somebody from Turkey. And she finished that day her ijazah of Qur'an. She went to go get tested and they give you this beautiful roll certificate of your ijazah of Qur'an with the whole sanad and who the teacher was, who the sheikh was and who the teacher was. And she was so excited, not only because she received the ijazah, but she said, look, look, on the very corner, it tells you what number, you know, because they issue, right? Certificate, endowment-based uh, certificates with numbers. Which number are you? And these are in the thousands and thousands of these ijazas, mashallah. Hers said number one. Because hers was the very first given from Ansa Samar herself, from the woman teacher, mashallah. Beautiful, beautiful, alhamdulillah. I hope to inspire you. These are all currently living amongst us women scholars. May Allah bless them and us. And I'm telling you, whether it's a sister from Turkey or whether it's myself or whether it's all of us, I think all of us would agree, or all of you, we're just ordinary people, folks. <laughs> We're ordinary people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for and blessed. And you and us, inshallah, can be extraordinary in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes when you make the commitment, make the intention, and the doors start opening, subhanAllah, and then be community and sisters for each other. Inshallah, with that, I'm going to end, and we'll have our maghrib prayer together. There are a couple of housekeeping announcements to us I'll say after our ending here. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I want to thank you all for your time and your attention today. Alhamdulillah. And everybody who is online, welcome. And mashallah, we're so happy to have you. Please continue joining the Rahma Foundation and the Jannah Institute's programming all throughout the week and the months. And with that, my dear sisters, we'll close, inshallah, with our dua. Just la ilaha illa anta subhanak inna kunna min al لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم لك الحمد اللهم لك الحمد اللهم لك الحمد حمدا يليق بجلالك وعظيم سلطانك ربنا أنت 
أنت ولينا وأنت مولانا ربنا إنك ترى مكاننا وتسمع كلامنا وتعلم سرنا وعلانيتنا ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إننا ظلمنا أنفسنا ظلما كثيرا فاغفر لنا غفرانا كثيرا فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت سبحانك ما عبدناك حق عبادتك ولا قدرناك حق قدرك فاغفر لنا أنت الغفور الرحيم أنت الرحيم الودود أنت السميع القريب ربنا صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا ربنا ارزقنا اتباع سنته ربنا ارزقنا اتباع سنته ربنا ترزقنا اتباع سنته ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا أمين الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا ضالين فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاولون تأكلون التراث أكلا لما الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا 
وَجِيءَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمَ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنْسَانُ وَأَنَّ لَهُ الذِّكْرَى يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي قَدَّمْتُ لِحَيَاتِي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله العظيم الذي لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم وأتوب إليه استغفر الله العظيم الذي لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم وأتوب إليه استغفر الله العظيم الذي لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم وأتوب إليه اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم إنا نسألك من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم اللهم يا مقلب القلوب والأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على دينك نلقاك وأنت راض عنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نستودعك شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله شهادة تردها علينا عند احتضارنا ومماتنا وبعثنا يا أرحم الراحمين صلاة تثقل بها موازيرنا يا أرحم الراحمين يا الله اغفر لنا ارحمنا ارزقنا استرنا يا أرحم الراحمين انصرنا يا أرحم الراحمين وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه ويسر لنا الخير والهدى حيث كان اجعلنا واجعل أولادنا قرة عين لحبيبك المصطفى سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم إنا نشهدك أننا نحبه ونبلغه السلام يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لم نره في الدنيا فاجمعنا به في الآخرة يا أرحم الراحمين اجمعنا به يقظة ومناما يا أرحم الراحمين دينا وآخرة يا أرحم دنيا وآخرة يا أرحم الراحمين 
نلقاك وأنت راض عنا وصل اللهم على نور الهدى سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم إلى شرف النبي وآله الفاتحة